recorded for posterity. Right, I'm going to try this again. So this slide does two things, provides some color, and uh, it provides a, a, a distinct metaphor for the importance of rules and technical guidance as building blocks to the LSRP program uh, and the training that we're going to do for both of those. Everybody who's in LSRP and their support groups and everybody in DEP needs to know everything that's in the guidance and everything that's in the rules. Uh, it's essential to our success. Why stakeholder input? Sarah required us to do it, but that's not the only reason that we did it. Uh, and some of us were more skeptical than others. I've been with the department a long time, uh, and this involvement of stakeholders in this process is unprecedented to the previous uh, how many years I've been working on rules and guidance and all this stuff at DP. Uh, but it was it's really essential. The, the Act requires us to do it, but it turns out that it's really essential to building a process that's going to work going forward. Um, it was building consensus. As Dan said, there are uh, 15 or 16 different committees right now developing guidance. Uh, the first two that were done are, are LNAPL and receptor evaluation. That's why we're here today. And we're going to do training on each one of those as they get finished and posted on the website. Each of the committees had members that created a balance of technical expertise, regulatory knowledge, and practical application. It was essential to have those components to make a guidance document that was clear, understandable, and doable. All those things are pretty important. The chairs were, were uh, the each committee had a chairperson that was a, a DEP person and a oversight person from an oversight committee with uh, George Nicholas and myself, Sue Shannon, Kathy Katz, and Joe Novak to help make sure that each committee was making uh, the progress that they needed to make. And so each guidance document is really based on a great deal of thought and effort and hours at the table building consensus. Issues that were couldn't be settled were, I don't think we even got any that couldn't be settled at the committee level, but they had the, um, the process that they could raise those to DEP management. But they were able to work out reasonable, uh, reasonable ways to approach things that uh, were contentious. Each uh, draft, final draft guidance document had a six-week review period. They got comment. We got comments from stakeholders, SRP management, SRP staff, uh, and and then the committees were then responsible to um, evaluate all the comments, put incorporate them into a guidance into the guidance document or into a response to comments that will be posted along with these guidance documents. Um, and they were required to, they worked with the Tech Rules Committee so that what's coming up in the new proposal will mesh and we know where we're going with both the guidance and the rules. And they're developing training such as this. So everybody's seen this slide a number of times. Everybody gets it, um, that the rules contain the what and guidance contains the how. So rules are the new standard and regulatory requirements that are enforceable. Guidance is a scientifically defensible technical approaches on how to comply with the regulations. Here they are, the guidance uh, committees, all in uh, various states of completion. Actually, I have a, two are final and posted. Eight comment periods are closed. Three comment periods are open and four are yet, uh, yet to come for comments. Keep an eye on the website. We'll send out list, message, uh, list messages, uh, listserv messages, and we will be posting things on our webpage regarding upcoming training. So keep an eye on this page. 
And uh, if you don't know that this web page also has the quick reference guide, some of which you have in your packets. You have a copy of the slides and a copy of the pertinent quick reference guides. And then um, if you're not in the department, you're from outside the department, you will register via the LSRPF website. You should all be familiar with this since you are here today. And uh, so I'm going to introduce Steve Mayberry. He has been with the department for over 23 years. He's the Bureau Chief of State Case Management, and he was the chairperson of the Receptor Evaluation Committee. Thanks, Tess. Um, the way we're going to work the discussion of receptor evaluation is um, we, uh, I will talk, a little, uh, take about 10 minutes to talk about some of the big picture items, talk a little bit about the regulations. Um, and then Phil Brilliant, he's going to kind of break down uh, by section following the form, receptor evaluation form, and talk about the receptor evaluation through that evaluation. Um, Nick Sedano is going to break in uh, when we get to the well search portion. Uh, he's with our uh, information systems group, and he's going to talk a little bit about well searches and the spreadsheet and kind of the vision toward the future. Um, let's see if we can get this thing going. Uh, here's our stakeholder committee. Um, I think we collaborated very well from the very beginning. Uh, I feel very comfortable saying if you have a receptor evaluation question, you could call any of these folks, including our uh, consultants at the bottom there. Um, <clears throat> one of the first uh, things that we uh, worked on in the committee, and the biggest decision we made was, and different than any of the other uh, committees, we decided that we did not want to do a standalone uh, guidance document that we thought that the regulations were fairly clear and through uh, modifying FAQs, by new FAQs, by the receptor evaluation uh, form guidance, and maybe even some other, like the spreadsheet uh, guidance that you're going to hear about later, uh, we could fill in the, the blanks there. So that's the route we took. So you're not going to find a standalone document for receptor evaluation. Uh, the principles uh, that I think you need to kind of pay attention to are uh, the first two. We'll talk about the need to do an ongoing uh, receptor evaluation throughout the entire remediation process. Uh, that the first priority of uh, remediation is really to protect receptors. That's why we do, at the end, that's why we do remediation, is to protect receptors, protect public wells, protect private wells. Uh, protect people from vapor intrusion, etc. Um, the next four points are really, if you if you if you pay attention to these points, at the end of the day, you'll have a good receptor evaluation. They're very basic. Uh, first is identifying your receptors early. Okay, find out where your potable wells are. Find out where your residential, your car parks and daycare centers are. Uh, evaluate the the pathways uh, for the contamination. Uh, and conduct sampling if there's any potential uh, risk to receptors. And finally, if, you, if the data suggests that there's a risk, you take actions that are appropriate. Could be a fence around the site, could be putting pellets on, could be putting a VI system in. Pretty basic, but at the end of the day, uh, that's the bottom line. Uh, the receptor evaluation process versus the form. We're all very results-oriented, deadline-oriented, so everybody knows that the, the uh, most people should know that the receptor evaluation regulatory time frame is passed. Um, so the, the heat's off. What's important, I think, the takeaway that I'd like to bring is it's the, the receptor evaluation process is what's important to ensure that the consultants out there, both in the office and in the field, when they get the information, they're looking at the receptors and making decisions based on on the new information that comes in, and that's throughout the entire process. So I want people to understand, focus on making sure you have a good process in your office to evaluate the information. The form will fill itself out at the end. I mean, that's, it's that simple. If you do things right in the process, the form is easy. 
Uh, when do you start the receptor evaluation? When you initiate remediation. When there's been a notification of a discharge or you have an ISRA trigger. That's when the process starts. When does it end? It ends when you get an unconditional no further action or remedial action outcome. Now, the form itself, though, is not required when you have a remedial action outcome uh, with a uh, limited or restricted use of remedial action, because at that point you'll be under a permit. You'll have CEAs and deed notices. So what takes over is, in the receptor evaluation process, is that biennial certification process. That's where you'll continue to look at receptors, you'll continue to look at VI and, and groundwater through that process versus submitting the form. Uh, regulatory timeframes, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the March 1 deadline is already passed for the submission of the form. Um, for new cases, after March 1 of 2010, uh, the remediation time frame is one year from initiation and remediation. Uh, you're also required, as you submit uh, updates and new key documents to the department, to update the receptor evaluation. Um, and very important is time extensions. And we'll talk about this a little bit in the regular, in the mandatory time frames in a minute. Uh, you can get uh, extensions of time if you're in the middle of BI investigation, really want to do a thorough job, want to fill out the form. All you have to do is submit a uh, extension request with the valid reasons why, uh, and it's approved unless you hear otherwise. So you don't need pre-approval for regulatory extension. And that's not just for receptor evaluation, that's throughout the rule. There are also uh, time frames for uh, conducting remediation, uh, regulatory time frames in the rule. Uh, some examples here, potable water, you have 90 days to do a well search, you have 120 days to identify wells in, in the area, sample them. Uh, same is basically true to a receptor evaluation, you have 60 days once you have a VI trigger to go ahead and uh, evaluate what structures you're going to look at, get the details of the structures, 150 days late after the trigger, you need to uh, have that sampling conducted. So I just want to call those, those type of time frames to your attention. They do exist in the role. Um, I would recommend that uh, the LSRPs, consultants out there, have a copy of the quick guide, which is kind of a quick summary of the regulations uh, for receptor evaluation. Uh, and the mandatory and time frame guidelines are also just lay out the, in a quick summary form what those time frames are. Mandatory time frame is coming up for receptor evaluation. For those of you that have not uh, submitted the, met the regulatory deadline, uh, March 1, 12 is the mandatory deadline. Uh, and for new cases, the mandatory deadline is two years from initiation or remediation. Uh, time frame extensions are different from mandatory time frames in that you need pre-approval to get an extension beyond the mandatory time frame. It's not impossible. Uh, dissuade anybody from getting it with good reason, uh, but uh, you do need to have pre-approval. For both extensions, you should get the extension in 30 days before the deadline. Okay? Uh, the difference between the regulatory and mandatory time frames is, are the consequences. If you fail to meet a regulatory time frame, the consequence is potential penalties under the grace period rule. If you miss a mandatory deadline, you not only have penalties, but you also have uh, the department, uh, in the case of uh, the receptor evaluation, uh, is required by statute to take over the remediation. That's not a spot that you want to put any of your clients in uh, because the department disperses funds, makes the decisions on what remediation is going to be conducted. It's not a spot that the department wants to be in either, by the way. So just pay attention to that March 1 deadline uh, if you uh, haven't submitted the uh, receptor evaluation. Uh, what are the, some of the guidance documents that you should have that uh, we've worked on? Uh, we didn't work as a committee. We didn't work on the tech regs per se, uh, but you have to have obviously the tech regs. They're pretty straightforward. Uh, go through the, uh, basically what, how the form is set up. Uh, the quick reference guide for receptor evaluation. Again, I have it in my office. When I get the calls, that's what I refer to. FAQs, uh, we have FAQs out there for the receptor evaluation, recommend you go through that, some well search uh, guidance and so forth is in there. 
And the, uh, very important, read the receptor evaluation form instructions. The, the form instructions, there's a lot of information uh, that you really need. A, a lot of times people don't read the instructions. Please read those instructions. They, they will really help you out at the end. Okay. Uh, now I'll let uh, Phil Brilliant. Uh, he's going to step up and kind of take us section by section uh, through the uh, through the form, and hopefully highlight some of the issues and uh, uh, ideas uh, that we uh, kicked around uh, during our discussions in the committee. So with that, I'll turn it over to Phil, and uh, he'll take it from here. Uh, yeah. okay. Thanks, Steve. Hopefully everybody online can hear me. Uh, good morning, everybody. Steve kind of covered a lot of the regulatory aspects. I'm going to really give you some more of the practical aspect, what a consultant LSRP um, really needs to think about as you go through the receptor evaluation process. And, and my goal is really to reinforce two points. And if you've heard me speak before, you know those two points. It is that the receptor evaluation process starts in the beginning. You start early in the, the process, you start looking at potential receptors, and it continues through the entire investigation. You should never stop thinking about the receptors and updating your evaluation as you go forward. The second part is, and I'll talk about it on one of the slides, document, document, document. Everything in this New World program, whatever I'm not supposed to say about it, um, is about documentation as the LSRP. You're using your professional judgment, and you need to make sure that in the event of an audit, an inspector review, whatever it might be, that you've documented what you've done. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that when it comes to the form information. Did I go the right way? Okay. Um, again, one of the things you're starting to hear, you know, I think other states have heard a lot more about it over the years, conceptual site model. We're starting to talk more about it in New Jersey. There's a guidance document that I believe is out right now for comment on conceptual site model. You know, this is really you know, where the receptor evaluation ties into how you're doing your investigation. Okay? You're not only looking at you know, what your sources are, what potential pathways are of contamination, but what receptors may be impacted you know, by the migration of contamination. And I, I had a client who used to always yell at me at least once a year when we did project reviews, that I was basically taking him on a road around the city. And we were always going around and around in that car, and we were never getting to an endpoint. Okay? With conceptual site model, what you're doing is you're designing that endpoint. As you go through, putting all the pieces of your investigation and your receptor evaluation in and looking at pathway contaminants and those receptors that are in, in the flow. Okay, the form, and I was in the forms committee, so you can shoot me later. But you know, basically, the form is part of the process. You know, you're filling it out at different milestones. Again, Steve already said the initial form was due March 1st for some of the old cases, and it's a year after the initiation of remediation for all other cases. Read the instructions; they're self-explanatory. Okay, the FAQs we've posted on site are to help you to get through those questions you may not necessarily know the answers to. And document on the form if there's something you believe that you don't understand or that doesn't apply to you. Don't be afraid to make notes on the form or add backup to the form. Reference the question number, add it to the back so the reviewer at DEP knows why you didn't necessarily answer the question you know, with a affirmative answer or a negative answer. Answer the questions justified. Uh, what I was supposed to say there, too, is, I mean, basically the 16,000 sites in New Jersey, there's one form. So it, it has to apply to the universe. So that's why it's important to think about it that way. Oh, my slides are in a different order. Uh, initial versus interim. As we said, March 1st, was an initial receptor evaluation form. It doesn't matter if 20 years ago you did a well search. Okay? When you submitted March 1st, that was the initial form that was being submitted. It included information other than just well searches, VI, 
you know, basically it was due with the information that you had at that time. Because again, as I said in the beginning, it's an ongoing process. When you go to milestone reports, and it might be remedial investigation report, remedial action report, you're going to do an interim, an update of that receptor evaluation. Land use, another part of your receptor evaluation. Who potentially might be impacted by contamination from the site? What are the surrounding land uses? What's the use of the property that you're investigating? Okay, current uses as well as what potential uses might be. You know, if you're, if you're walking in the neighborhood and you walk, you know, the site, you know, immediately down gradient of your property and it says future residential properties, 300 units. You need to think about, well, what's the potential flow of my contamination and is the, you know, the pathway, you know, potentially going to impact this property and down the road I need to think about this property as a receptor. Again, I've said it 20 times already, it's an ongoing process as you go through. We've done a few FAQs. Again, it's important to look at that. As Steve said, we didn't come out with a specific guidance document. We've addressed some of the issues like a large site where you have a single AOC where you may need to give yourself a variance relative to how you're going to look at adjacent properties. And one of the key parts, you know, that I think that's important, and I know Neil stressed when he did the presentation two weeks ago, a degree of certainty. Using your professional judgment. Make sure when you make that judgment relative to receptor evaluation, land uses around the property. Um, if you're, again, a single AOC on a large site, that you document it and you feel confident in that decision you've made and it will stand the muster. Okay, really what it comes down to. Um, pretty much self-explanatory, sensitive population within two feet, your residential properties, your schools, your child care centers, you know, other recreational uses in the area. You're all tying that into your receptor evaluation. And as Steve said, if you by some chance are sitting there with the form in front of you, I'm going right down the form. It's, it's pretty, it takes you right through the process. Okay. Groundwater use, you know, initial well search. Steve talked about the requirements when you have to do it. You know, you have groundwater contamination greater than the groundwater remediation standards. You're doing a well search. The time frame Steve talked about. There is one, you know, if you have low level concentrations, and you can confirm within 30 days, you may not have to do a well search, whatever that might be, okay? You need to identify the wells. You need to identify them on a map. The extents are within in the rules as to how far you have to go. When you submit your receptor evaluation form, you do not need to submit the entire well search. You fill out the spreadsheet that Nick's going to talk about in a few minutes. When you submit your milestone report, you have to submit the entire well search. So that's an important thing to remember. Resources that are available to you. In the old days, you would fill out the form, send it in a DEP, and wait for, you know, three boxes of well records to come back to you, and there are about four of them that were in your radius area because, you know, maybe the uh, coordinates weren't correct. Nowadays, there's many different resources available to you. you know, they're listed right here. You have the DEP GIS system. You still have the well, well records that you can request. Nick's going to talk about in his process how you can refine that. Okay. Well records online, maybe sometime in the future, maybe not. We'll see how things go. And county and local also have copies of well records and have information. Um, in a brief scenario of a site in North Jersey, we're doing a neighborhood canvas, and lo and behold, we came up with one irrigation well that nobody knew was there. Went to the counties, they didn't have it, the locals don't have it either. So it really, you know, made us think, you know, are there other wells in this area you need to continue to, to go out and think about, you're using your professional judgment, protecting receptors, do I need to go a little further because I found one well? At this time, I'm going to invite Nick up. Nick's going to take you through the uh, electronic search that can be done at DEP and how that process is. And this is, for those of you who may have heard me speak before, this is the video that I've talked about that is very informative and will be on the DEP's website one day 
which I think is a huge step forward in getting fast information on wells surrounding properties. So without further ado, Nick. Good morning, uh, Nick Sedano, Bureau of Information Systems. Uh, the reason I put up this slide is uh, because, you know, it, it is a partnership with um, the consultant community. We hear back about how, you know, there could be improvements made. Um, absolutely. Um, we, we are improving the spreadsheet, giving more options in the drop down. Uh, I just want to let you know that I really appreciate those comments that come in because um, the more eyes on it, the better. So I um, wanted to get that out there right away. Um, I'm going to show it, uh, about a 10 and a half minute summary video that will explain uh, a lot about the spreadsheet, um, the uh, online resources and GIS procedures that are available for you to help speed you along with uh, filling out that speech, uh, the uh, spreadsheet. Um, I also want to forewarn you that this, this video is going to move really quickly over uh, a lot of ground. Um, there is a, a, a full instructional video that um, I was balked at when I first uh, showed it. They told me to uh, make it more summary for, for this presentation. But uh, there's, there's a lot of detail that you'll need. Uh, there's also a written document, like a companion document that goes with it. All of that's going to get out there on the web soon. Um, I want to talk about the um, query that's online, the XY query. Uh, we're really close to getting a new one that, um, that'll be more efficient and provide a lot more information. Instead of going to multiple sources, hopefully we'll, we'll just be in this one query getting you all the things that you used to have to go to different places for. Um, before I roll the video, I want to focus on a few points which have been a source of confusion. Uh, first of all, the current online query does not yet replace the manual half mile and mile well search that you uh, need to request through the U.S. mail. Um, it's you know going to change soon, but um, you just uh, should keep in mind that the current online query provides a result that does not call out the water allocation diversion permit wells from the standard wells per se. They're in there, but you can't tell. You know we're going to fix that. Um, like I alluded to on the 15th, the, the new query is just about ready for release, and it, it'll uh, eliminate a lot of um, the old written requ requests and provide uh, separation for the one-half mile and uh, one-mile search requirements. Finally, like any database, the permit database has some errors. Um, this video will discuss how these errors can be caught and fixed. Submission of the well search spreadsheet uh, from the community of consultants represents a real public-private partnership. You, all of your decentralized efforts to refine well location and well status is captured by the state and managed as a single database that we will eventually be able to serve back out to you. Uh, with that, let's watch the video. Sound.
sunod. <laughs> so is it playing online? It. No, it's not, it's not playing. Yeah. It's not playing online either? No. It's not playing anywhere. It was working before you all sat down. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, quick. Do you want to do a quick coffee break? Yeah, why not? Hey, while we uh, work out these technical difficulties, uh, why don't the people here take a quick break and we'll we'll come back. Should just be a couple minutes. This is the bridge how to video submission of compliant. This is the bridge how to video submission. Yeah, we did that before. Don't touch it. Submission of compliant Wilson. Excellent. Now for your viewing pleasure. This is the bridge health. All right, I can just start. I can get a right here. Start it. Start it. Go for it. How to video for submission of a compliant well-sent spreadsheet. It primarily gives some broad concepts about how GIS and other e tools can help you quickly find receptive wells and complete the spreadsheet. It touches on some details that have proven challenging or widely misunderstood. The full how-to video will be posted to the web for those who feel they can benefit from its detailed instruction. Subchapter 1 of the technicals provides a deadline for the location of pollutable well types and the potential path of pollutants that may migrate from the known point of contamination. At 1.15, the rule states that such situations require the submission of the form of DEP. That form and its accompanying spreadsheet can be found at the web address shown here. The spreadsheet will be discussed in detail later, but for now, just know that a completed GIS well search deliverable only requires the submission of a completed spreadsheet. The rule goes on to state that a review of all available records should be completed to locate these wells. This video shows you how to use one of the available online data sources known as Data Miner. Please note that Data Miner does not replace the order. But if done first, can increase the efficiency in the field. Aside from data miner, efficient completion of the GIS deliverable spreadsheet would be enhanced with the use of multiple free GIS layers. While some of these e-tools are listed on the slide, you should review all the free data available for download and determine other layers would be useful. The information provided by data miner is of great assistance, but it's important to understand its limitations and how you can improve the data with GIS and other e-tools. Briefly, you should understand that the vast majority of well permit records are stored by Atlas Grid cell number, which is an area of about 1,000 by 1,200 feet. Aside from public supply wells and modern wells with the permit numbers prefix of P or E, all permits in the database should be assumed to have a generic Atlas cell location that must be refined. While the data miner query is hitting on close to a million well records, users should not assume that all wells are in this database. Furthermore, as you will see in a few minutes, some of the wells in the database were associated with the wrong Atlas grid number, so selecting the area around your site will not necessarily return the well. The bottom line here is that the query is only a part of the well search, and the final step in completing that search is a door-to-door -door survey. We expect that new queries are still eliminating the old manual procedures we have used for years. But for the time being, the first step you should take in your groundwork receptor evaluation is to send in an order supply form through the mail and request only one half and one mile searches as for more so. This will ensure that you will be able to detect any discrepancy between the online search and the manual search. NJDEP will notify the consultant community as soon as the new online search is once you have successfully downloaded the latest version of the Wells Survey Spreadsheet, your next step should be to locate your site in GIS. In doing so, you then can determine the X and Y state mean coordinates. When completed, you then can create a shape tile for the thousand foot radius and another for the half mile radius. If you know the groundwater flow direction, you should create a third shape file which reflects the area of 250 feet up gradient 
500 feet side gradient, and 1,000 feet down gradient of the points of groundwater contamination. This is the area defined by 1.17A to double. Next, turn off the 1,000 and half mile shape files and turn on the Atlas grid. Now you can use the parabolic shape file to select the Atlas cells on which you should focus. These selected Atlas cells serve as your focus well search area. Now that you have narrowed down the search area as per the technical rules, let's use data mining to collect all global well types in the area and save them to a blank spreadsheet. But beware of a common error involving the way people refer to state name coordinates. Some refer to them as northern and easting, which is not wrong, but is exactly opposite of another commonly used name of XY coordinates. This sometimes leads to a reversal of coordinates entered into the data mining query, producing an erroneous result. We suggest that you view the detailed tutorial for this process. Once we have created the spreadsheet for the data mining query, we bring it into GIS, but notice that it will not draw. That's because four of the records returned public community wells, which have had their X and Y coordinates redacted because of Homeland Security issues. In order to have this table draw, we will have to create another table with only the records that have X and Y coordinates. Bringing the modified table into GIS, we see that the remaining records now draw. But in order to see the public community supply wells that we had to remove from the table, we can bring in the public community supply layer which we downloaded from GIS. That's one of the free downloads discussed earlier. For records that have tax lots, as with the first record here, we can match the well to the GIS tax lot and refine the location rather quickly. But as you can see in this example, three of the four records have no tax lot information, so we will need to request additional information from the DEP. In order to get that information, we need to create a spreadsheet which has a single column containing only permit numbers. The permit numbers are highlighted blue here. Don't forget to include all the permit numbers in the focus search area as discussed earlier in the presentation. In this instance, it includes the four community supply wells which had no X and Y values in the data miner query. The request for the additional data should be sent via email to well permitting at DEP as shown here. It's important to include the program interest number for the site in the subject line, along with the words SRP search. Inside the body of the email, write your company name and address and a phone number for the company contact. Include the name of the site and a statement that you are conducting a receptor search for site and then we need the well permits and well records for the permit numbers in the attached spreadsheet. After DEP provides the additional data we requested for the permit numbers, we will be able to view the location data for the well owner, which in this case shows a Mount Holly location. It specifically claims that the well was drilled in Mount Holly, but there is no street number for the address and no tax lot. So in order to refine this well location, we would need to scroll down to the drillers drawing. Here we see a basic sketch with none of the requested distance measurements. It shows a stream which is labeled Barker's Road and gives unlabeled roads. There is an intersection called Chambers Corner, and to the east we see a notation that Johnstown will be found. Using GIS for the stream and a Google search on Chambers Corner, we are quickly able to find that the roads and stream match the drawing. Going back to the previous extent where our site is, we can see that the surrogate well locations are here, but the actual location is 15,000 feet to the northeast. You are nearly finished, so let's do a brief review. First, you found the correct X and Y for your points of groundwater contamination in GIS. Using those, you created the regulatory limits for your search area. You then selected the atlas grid cells which touched this area. You then collected the raw search data from the well permits query on data miner. You removed the non multiple types and then called that list in GIS to select only the permits found in your focus search area. You then removed the redacted XY values. You then displayed the remaining permits in GIS. At that point, you added the redacted records back to GIS by using the public community supply wells layer. Next, you refined the available search area permits by using block and lot values where they were available. Then you requested the well permits and well record from DEP by email. Upon receiving those, you use the permit image to further refine the location of any well that was in the search area. At this point, you are ready to add your well data to the well search reporting spreadsheet. Completing the spreadsheet at this point means that you have reviewed NJDEP well documents. Recall from earlier in this presentation that DEP's database and documents are helpful but do not represent a complete list of all well drilled. 
A door-to-door -door survey is still needed. The online process is likely providing you with accurate locations for many or even all of the receptor wells within your potential impact area and will help speed your survey. It is suggested that at this point you review water system records, tax records, phone records, and any other tools that help you gain current contact information for the survey of well owners. After you have contacted owners, you are ready to update status and coordinate method fields in the well search spreadsheet and to add any wells not found in the online search. Please view the detailed how-to video to hear more information on the spreadsheet and each of the tips. Finally, let's discuss common sufficient problems associated with the well survey spreadsheet. First, it's helpful to recognize that the spreadsheet has a stripped-down format designed for maximum GIS functionality. Many well-intentioned users have redesigned the table, modifying header names and moving column positions. These outcomes produce a more pleasing format for humans to read, but it kills GIS functionality. Please leave the table format unmodified. Second, the basing of values from the data miner spreadsheet can save time, but has also shown cause problems if people simply miss their marks, pasting data in the wrong fields. Also, some data pasted doesn't precisely match valid value dropdowns. In either case, the data is lost. Pasting must be done with care. Finally, the coordinate method and status fields have specific definitions. The definitions of these are found in the instruction manual and will be posted to the web, along with the detailed how-to video. Also, Coordinate method and status fields may need revision between the time the spreadsheet is initially filled out and the time it is submitted to DEP. This is because at first you were filling the spreadsheet out based on paper records, but later you may have new data from the door-to-door -door survey. Remember, the usefulness of the GIS data we build for use by LSRPs and the general public depends on the effort put into these spreadsheets. We look forward to improving this database and serving that data back to you with increasing accuracy and speed. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll get those things out on the web like we were talking about. And uh, now I'm going to uh, send it back to Phil. After 20 some odd years of being in the site remediation program, we should do a uh, name those voice after that video. Okay, where am I? Here. Okay. Nick's presentation basically went through very quickly, and again, I believe this is going to be something, it's going to be a continuous ongoing process as things change. As Nick said there's a longer video that hopefully will be up sometime, and I will tell you that Nick is uh, you know, always willing to help anybody. So, you know, questions, comments, you know, you put them through, you'll be able to get through the process. But this is really important, you know, in how things change at DEP and how we can get information quicker as consultants. Now you learned how to do it. What do we do with all this information we have? You know, again, talked about well locations, confirming where they are, and plotting how they, they fall into place based upon your plume extent. You know, I talked a little bit before about your visual survey. You know, making sure, you know, that you haven't missed any wells, wellheads that are very visible, um, doing a walkthrough, water supply lines that may be in the area. You want to make sure you're looking at any potential pathway of contaminants. Door-to-door -door survey, it is still in the, in the rule. Well, I can't say still. I haven't seen the rules yet. That'll be sometime in August. We'll sit back and wait. Uh, we'll assume it's still in the rules. And uh, again, if it's an area where you're uncertain if there's water usage and you've gone back and everybody's told you there's no wells, you know, you're using your professional judgment as LSRPs, as consultants, you know, to take that information for what people are telling you and also what your well search is showing you. If you have question and you can't use that degree of certainty, then you need to go out and you need to look and make sure you're not missing any receptors. Um, 
and you can modify you know, your door-to-door -door canvas and how you're doing your investigation based upon the information that you're building, taking a step back in your conceptual site model. As you're looking at your plume, as you're looking at the size of your plume and your contaminant pathways and narrow down the area or in some situations you may have to expand the area that you are canvassing. Quickly go through and you know these are things that are in rules. Um, you know where you're sampling, when you have to sample. You know we've had some changes and this is something that's important as you're looking at well search data now. You know previously we didn't look all the time at side gradient and up gradient. Well, now we are, okay? So there may be some wells that historically you didn't look at that you may need to go back and look at now. Again, using your professional judgment is it something you need to look at. You should always look at the worst scenario first, the well closest to your property, and then work your way from there. Irrigation wells, it's based upon the exposure of those irrigation wells. Are they residential? Is it recreational? Is it a child care center? Is it something that may have exposure to people? As I said before, I was on the forms committee, so always remember, whatever you do, there is a form for it. So before you go out and sample, you've got to submit a form to DEP, let them know you're sampling. Okay? And then when the results come in, you're looking at the results, you're evaluating them against the standards. If there's an exceedance, you have an IEC condition, there's another guidance document you can go follow. Okay? If you don't have an exceedance, you've got to submit that data within 14 days of DEP. VI, again, working through the form, going to the next section. You have an obligation to do a VI investigation if it's triggered. Triggers are self-explanatory within 30 feet for petroleum or 100 feet for other volatiles or free products. Um, except number two fuel oil or diesel. That's one of the corn pops. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is it's not, you know, if you have a situation where you have um, a vapor problem in a building, you've also triggered. It's something that came up recently on one of my sites where, you know, we basically didn't have a standard pathway, but we had vapors in a building, and we had to go look at the indoor air constituents there and then backtrack a little, a little to different sources. Steve went over your triggers. You know, basically you got to identify the structures that you may have to go out and sample. You're going to look at utilities that may be pathways. And, you know, again, you need to know your groundwater flow direction. You're basically looking at um, what your VI trigger, what your VI properties may be. And then implement sampling within 150 days. What I stress in my office, and I'll stress out to all the consultants, when you see you have a trigger and you start identifying properties, get access agreements out quick. Don't sit back and wait for the 149th day, because I'll tell you, as we get further into this program, and on the next slide, I'm sure it's going to say you have to submit a form. When you submit a form, you know, Steve talked about extensions and regulatory time frame extensions. You have to submit 30 days in advance, and they're approved by rule, okay? 60 days for mandatory time frames, and the DEP has to respond to you. If you're just applying for access on the last days, DEP is going to start looking at these things and looking at you as a consultant and your client to make sure you're protecting human health and the environment. Um, oh yeah, there's a form. Make sure you submit the form before you do your indoor air or your sub-slab sample if you're just going out for the first part of your VI. When you get the results back, once again, you're evaluating the results against the, uh, the criteria set forth. If you have something over the criteria, it's an IEC, you have another guidance document to follow. If you are below the, the criteria, you have to submit the report within 14 days to DEP. Your service lab, again, you're looking, whoa, too close to the microphone. Uh, you're, you're looking at potential pathways of contamination. That's what this whole receptor evaluation is about, okay? What's depth of groundwater? Do I have potentials for vapors to migrate through utility trenches? Do I have potential for groundwater to migrate through utility trenches, okay? Knowing where potential pathways are is the important aspect of this investigation, okay? There is an FAQ, I believe, if I remember correctly, on large, on residential properties, okay? If, if everybody is on, uh, you know, city water, you can make the assumption everybody's on city water, okay? So you know where the utilities might be going into each of these properties, 
As I said, you want to map these. You want to know where they are. You want to make sure if you have your plume and you have a defined plume that you basically don't have contaminants going into these pathways and leading towards these potential receptors. I already stated, if they're single family homes, you can assume that a service line runs to each of the structures. Last but not least in our checklist, you have a baseline ecological evaluation that you must do in accordance with the rules. Um, basically, you have to have it conducted and you have to report this on the form. The B ties into your conceptual site model. If you have potentially ecological receptors that may be impacted, if there is a source of contamination and you have a migration pathway to this ecological receptor, you have to report it on the form. And I believe also, I remember seeing in some of the emails about two months ago, there is a um, guidance document out on ecological evaluations. And not quite sure how everything's going to play out in the rules, but I would guarantee you that this requirement for a B is still going to be in there, not going to change. This was the slide I had earlier in my handout, but we'll go right now. These were some of the problems that were identified by reviewers when they received uh, you know, 50 boxes on a, or probably 50,000 boxes on March 1st. Um, forms were incomplete. I talked about that a little bit. If there's a question that you don't know necessarily how to answer, you want to give your best possible answer and give an explanation. You don't want to submit incomplete forms. And I, I think I said it originally, but again, your first submission of the form is the initial. So you check the box that says initial. Your second submission at milestone reports, your third submission, are intern. Okay, so make sure you're checking the right box on there. Um, I said it, the 16,000 sites, there's one form. The wording is not going to be perfect for every one of our sites. We have to give the best possible answer. It's almost like the SATs. You give the best possible answer. Um, and then, said it already, many of the questions were left blank. We don't want to see blanks. Oh, let me rephrase that. DP doesn't want to see blanks. I don't want to leave blanks. And, and basically, again, if, you, if there's something in question, backup documentation, reference the question, attach a separate page. And I think that is the end of the presentation. So I'll invite Steve and Nick up here to answer questions. How do you look at these we'll questions online? Yeah, we'll open up questions to the outside, too. So. Right. So, uh, okay. You guys have you take questions, Harry. Well, there's two things, Harry. First of all, the recept if if. You're going to get a, uh, from case initiation, if you're going to get an unrestricted remedial action outcome uh, within one year, site's clean, within a year, you don't need to do a receptor evaluation. You don't need to submit the form. Okay. Uh, so, could you repeat, repeat the rest of that question now? The rest of the question is, the initial receptor evaluation could go in with the first Right. It, it could. It could coincide. Uh, with the March 1 deadline, we got a lot of standalones. Going forward, that's going to become less and less and less. Okay. Assuming you can, you can do the milestone document at the same time, that's the best of both worlds. That's what we expect to happen. Okay. Can you repeat the question for the people online? Oh, sorry. Okay. Next question. Wow. Uh, see, see while, we're, while we're doing that, there's two points I'd like to clarify. First of all, um, the form itself, we have another revision to the form that's going to go out. We, we've been getting comments both uh, from our 
uh, colleagues on the committee and outside. Uh, the, some of the questions weren't yes and no. Some were, uh, you know, not applicable. Uh, so we've tried to correct the next version. We're trying to correct those. Um, so hopefully that will help with answering the question. And, and as I said, when in doubt with the uh, form itself, put a short explanation. If it's, if it's still a yes or no, but you don't think it fits your site, just put a short ex explanation. Uh, the other thing is on the well search, um, not to beat a dead horse, uh, we have the new XY well search that, that uh, hopefully in the next, I'm going to be optimistic, the next two weeks should be posted. We have a high level of confidence that that's going to capture, it cleans up the data a lot from the existing uh, XY well search. So we're going to have a new process. When that's announced on the website, basically what's going to happen is uh, you're going to do the XY well search. Uh, if you find wells of interest, you're then going to uh, submit those electronically uh, via email to the Bureau of uh, Well Permitting. They will send back just those records that you're interested in. Okay? They'll do a water allocation search for the redacted wells of interest plus do a, uh, send you back the specific records of interest at the LSRP, rather than to get a, a package that's two feet thick that you really don't want, um, you, you, you'll just get what you need. Uh, another point is, we're not really interested in monitoring wells. Many of the urban areas, you'll find hundreds, maybe thousands of monitoring wells. They don't have to be mapped for the receptor evaluation. They're not receptors in themselves. We're interested in people drinking the water and using the water for the receptor evaluation. Now, other questions? Yes? A door-to-door -door survey, well, it, it may differ depending on the area, but a door-to-door -door survey, you're looking at your plume and potential plume area. And as Phil said, he found a well by doing a door-to-door -door survey. It can be sending in the mail a questionnaire. It can be knocking on doors. Um, the circumstance where a door-to-door -door survey may not be necessary, at least in the initial well search, would be where where I live, everybody's on, everybody has private wells. So you know my house is a private well someplace. So you don't need to ask me if I have a private well. But the municipal, you know, the health officer will tell you, everybody in my development has private wells. There's no need. You might need to do knock on the door to say, do you have a well log? Can I sample your well? And those things. In many areas in New Jersey, though, it's a mixed use. You can find private wells in with public water supply. So in your plume area, you need to be sure, you need, you need to use your professional judgment to make sure that you're not missing anything. What we don't want are people drinking contaminated water. Well, yes, the, the question is, what do we mean by a door-to-door -door survey? Um, the initial door-to-door -door survey is looking within that thousand feet, right? And primarily what your public supply wells are pretty evident. You can see them online for the most part. Uh, you check with your municipality, you can find the public supply wells. Your private wells, though, are a different situation. Your well records are not always exact. You can be missing well records, and the only way you're going to do that in a lot of circumstances where you have this mixed use is to actually talk to folks. Yes? Work, work, start in and work your way work out. Work your way out, but you're looking at the first thousand feet. That's where you're starting. It's your first thousand feet. That's a reasonable thing. Professional judgment, do I have five PPB and a, a benzene in a well? You would start very close. Do I have five PPM migrating off site and has it been discharged 20 years? You may as well start at your full thousand foot. And, and make sure you're doing it right for, for square one. And that's where the professional judgment comes in. At the end of the day, the LSRP is responsible to make sure people are drinking clean water. And anything other than that would be a variance, and you need to justify it in your in your reports. Next question over here. Okay. There's a big question. The, the question is, if, is when the receptor evaluation is due, okay? If it's within that one year. Is that correct? Okay. Number one, 
Keep in mind, when I talk about the difference between the process and the, and the report, the receptor evaluation process starts at when you have contamination. So once you have contamination, if you have the trigger, the VI trigger, the groundwater trigger, uh, daycare, you're doing it. The report itself is just really a summary of what you've done in that one year. Okay? And you have one year to submit the report. What are we looking at from DP? We're looking to make sure you're following the process. Did you check for VI? Did you look at the triggers? Did you check for potable wells? Did you do those things? That's really what the report is about. Okay? It's that deadline, that one year report. Yes. The question is, in the uh, survey that was uh, that Nick's presentation, uh, the well locations are not exact. And the new XY search, first of all, will tell you, that there'll be definitions, and there's a column that tells you how that data was generated, okay? Whether it is an exact location, which would be either electronic or, or a GPS location, or whether it's an inexact location. What you're going to do is, you're going to look at the records, because most of the old wells were done on that, that grid, which means it's plus or minus about 1,000 feet, okay? Which is, in a 1,000 foot search, that's a big difference, right? 100%. So, what you're going to do is, you need the records, either you're going to do it door to door, right off the bat, depending on the situation, or you're going to wait to get those records back and try to do address matching. Okay? That's what you're going to do. Because, again, that 1,000 foot, the well, it could be 2,000 feet away, or it could be right on top of the site. So that's where you need to be very careful. Okay? So you have to acknowledge what the data that you're getting, the problems with that data. And that's not anything that can be rectified. Now, if you go out and have to sample the well, you will hopefully GPS those wells that need to be sampled. When it's submitted on the well search, the new well search, we will take that in, and then that will be a GPS by an LSRP well, and now we can use that for future surveys. And now we have exact location. So we hope to fix over the long period some of these well locations. Okay. Wow. Okay. I should take that one from Michelle. You want to take I'll take the one from uh, Michelle Smith. Um, Michelle was asking, what's the definition of a site? And I, I think I think what she's getting at um, is that, you know, we're we're talking about site, and in the rule it talks about point of groundwater contamination. So I, what I, what I think is probably the answer to that is that you you focus on your points of groundwater contamination for your search. You know, of course they they have to be attributable to the site to the discharge. Uh, the next one about the uh, the audio. I want to thank you for reporting that to us. Apparently the audio wasn't. Wasn't very good online. Huh. How do we want to do this? Um, you it. Up. Start at the top. Yeah. Where were we? Will presentation slides be posted online? <laughs> will Will the presentation slides be posted online? The answer is yes. Uh. How, how long does it take to get DEP manual well search back from DEP? Uh, I understand they're fairly well caught up during the receptor evaluation rush. They were backlogged in a major way. They are fairly well caught up. I think it's less than a month right now. Uh, again, that would be a, an area where if you need the information to fill out the receptor evaluation where it's good cause to get an extension. Uh, with the new XY search, uh, procedure I, I talked about a few minutes ago. That should there'll be less resources because we'll be just looking for those target wells rather than do a search of everything. Hopefully that will help. Uh, is there a guidance for access agreements for off-site sampling, VI sampling? Yeah, I think you need to take a look at the new draft VI guide. It's fairly comprehensive and it does talk about access and access issues. Uh, so next one. Uh, for BI groundwater, groundwater sampling, if you have a xylene spill, 
and there is a dissolved phase exceedance of only groundwater spring levels, does that count as petroleum and the 30-foot buffer, or do you have to use the 100-foot buffer? Um, the uh, number two fuel oil exceedance uh, uh, for product uh, is just for the product. If you have an exceedance of the uh, screen uh, levels in groundwater, um, you're using the appropriate distance. So for xylene, it is a petroleum product, so you'd use 30 feet. If it happened to be a chlorinated in groundwater, you would use 100 feet. VI utility mapping, you indicated it can be assumed that lines go into single family residence. Does that mean no utility mapping is required for a residential community or just the service lines going directly into the homes? Bill, you want to handle that one? Single family has to receive mapping going into the homes. So you're mapping utilities down the road if they're mains and stuff like that. Mains. That you're mapping, but the individual services to the residential property, you're not. Right. You, you can assume that every residence has utilities. It's not getting there by magic. So you can assume that, and if you want the bias, for instance, if you had to do VI sampling around those lines, that might be something you want to do. Okay. On the other... One of the other VI slides, it states that if you find VI exceedances, follow the IEC guidance. A contamination pathway must first be established between the sub-slab and indoor air exceedances. Hold on a second. Uh, must first be established between the sub-slab and indoor air exceedances to have an IEC or VC also. Uh, I think that's a statement. Um, that's correct. Uh, you have to have a completed pathway for it to be an IEC. If you just have, if you just go first phase, you do VI in the sub-slab, that's not an IEC. You go indoors, second phase, you take an indoor air sample, it's above it, that's where you would flip into the IEC guidance. Uh, what is the definition of a site? Uh, when we talk about site, we're talking about contaminated site. Okay. Uh, if we mean property, we're talking about property boundaries, okay? So in the rule where it says property, we mean the property boundaries, okay? So for instance, uh, the 200 feet is within 200 feet of the property, okay? Uh, for the public notification, it's 200 feet of the property. We mean site, we mean contaminated site. Okay. Uh, the example, it seemed like only wells that need to be shown on the well search spreadsheet are the 1,000, 250, 500 wells. But per the regs, don't all five one-mile applicable wells need to be put on the well search spreadsheet? The answer is yes, that is correct. Uh, if you, uh, during the well search, you're required to map uh, all wells excluding the monitoring wells, uh, within the half a mile. Uh, up to a mile, so between a half and a mile and one mile, you're looking for the large production wells, your community supply wells, your large irrigation, and your industrial wells. Okay? And they should all be on the map. So you're, you're looking close in, you're getting everything, larger wells on that distance between a half and one mile. Yeah. Distances. Yes, distances, yeah. Um, this is Nick speaking. Uh, I want to add to that that uh, you know many of those wells within that half mile are uh, not ones that you're going to get down the location to the you know the inches. You know there's ones that are well up gradient out of out of any zone that you would sample. Uh, you just report those back, and the spreadsheet accounts for the fact that you're not really refining the location of those. You can you can see that they're within the half mile and within that. Atlas Grid, you know where they are. When will the VI guidance be released? Uh, the draft has been released. Uh, currently looking at back on the comments. So, let's say 
can the uh, S-1070 access statute be used to compel access to conduct uh, off-site VI investigation? The answer is yes. Um, that allows uh, you to go to court if, if you need access uh, to gain access. Let a judge decide. Uh, wow, I like the last one. I think the last one. Uh, great presentation, very informative. <laughs> Oh, there is one more I missed. Uh, do we have to do a VI with number four and six? The answer is yes right now. We are looking at that uh, for further refinement of the uh, guidance. But right now you have to. All the way in the back. Well, it is, it is not specifically addressed. Oh, sorry. The question is, in the in receptor evaluation, you have VI guidance uh, guidelines, you have potable water guidelines, and you have, uh, for wells, and you have ecological. You don't have any specific uh, surface water uh, issues addressed. Uh, there is a requirement in tech rules to do surface water sampling to identify um, uh, receptors, ecological, and all receptors. Uh, it's not specifically addressed in the guidelines. Uh, we have looked at that, and we're continuing to look at that uh, for future rules, but it's not specifically referenced. Obviously, professional judgment, if you know there's a water supply nearby, uh, it is very unusual, though, to find uh, water supply problems because of the dilution factor uh, in most of the large water supplies in surface water. Yes? Right. The, the, the question is, when you find background contamination, I, I couldn't quite make out that. What, what compound is it? Paradichlorobenzene. They're finding it in the subslab. Wow. I'm not, I'm not aware of it in subslab. I mean, obviously, once you go indoors, it's a whole new ball of wax because you, you often find background contamination. I haven't heard of that specifically. Uh, and I'm not a uh, sub-slab expert. I would definitely talk to John Boyer on that. Um, just some very basics. If you're sampling for contaminants of concern and you're finding contamination that is not related to your site, and you as the LSRP feel comfortable with that assertion, we have a form for that. You would fill out its background contamination, and you wouldn't have to do indoor air if, in fact, that was the case. It was not from your site. Okay? That would be something... Uh, that the department might get involved with if it's for the health department, for instance, if it turns out to be an indoor air problem. So you wouldn't be, you're not legally responsible to track contamination that isn't related to a specific site. Um, on the, the, the compound you mentioned, I don't know the specifics of that. I'm not aware of finding it in sub-slab. I mean, we find all kinds of materials indoor. I would recommend you talk to John Boyer and see, uh, see if he is saying that on a lot of his sites, uh, you know, a lot of the information coming in. One more question. And then One more question. What is it? Michelle Smith. Uh, Michelle Smith. What's that? Nick. 
Okay, somebody, uh, <laughs> not, this is next to Donna. Somebody asked for my contact information. Um, my name is, uh, the, the email is nick.sodanl, and, uh, and it's like any other DEP email at dep.state.nj.us. My phone is 609-292-6255. One last one. Um, so on section B of the receptor evaluation form is talking about sensitive receptors within 200 feet of the site boundary. That means within 200 feet of what? The property boundary, the extent of the contaminated area. Some properties have one original property owner with contiguous, with contiguous contaminate, oh, sorry, contamination originated uh, from but have uh, contaminated other properties. Um, first of all, the, the contaminated site, again, is the contaminated site. Whatever properties that contamination exists on would be considered the site. That property boundary, for simplicity purposes, we're telling you is the initial screening to look within 200 feet of that property boundary. You can get a variance if uh, you have a big industrial park and it's a leaking tank in the middle of it, and there's an FAQ on that. Uh, but basically, we're talking about, as a first cut, we're talking about the property boundary. Now, you as professionals, obviously, if contamination is moving off-site, again, the idea of this is to protect receptors and make sure receptors are informed about issues. So you need to make that leap. The rule says, minimum, start with the property boundary. Okay? So... As you move out, obviously, if you have a groundwater plume moving out off-site, and you know that you're at 5 ppm high levels, you're going to be more conservative. More, you need to be more conservative in, in who you're going to contact and how you're going to go about it versus the 5 ppb, and you think it just you might not even make it off the property boundary. Okay. I I think that's a really really important point, especially because it was asked three times, uh, and we're just make sure nobody can leave this room until they get it. Okay, the first test? look, there will be a test, and you will only be allowed to leave if you get it, right? To, at the first look, 200 feet from the property boundary, that's the first start. And what Steve just said is as the contamination moves, if you have contamination moving off-site, you better keep looking within 200 feet of those, of the extent of contamination to make sure nobody's getting impacted. It's professional judgment. It's common sense. And we know you guys can do it. All right, so we're going to take a 10-minute break. Thank you. Thanks to these guys. They did a great job. And we're going to come back for El Napo.
I don't think so. It didn't. This isn't working. We're going to get started now. Um, did Steve mention to you that we get online things that you might be doing? Okay. Yeah. 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 Presentation on the receptor evaluation, and now we're going to go into the LNAPL technical guidance. I want to introduce Kevin Cretina. He's the Bureau Chief of the Bureau of Underground Storage Tanks. He's been with the department for approximately 26 years. And uh, I also want to point out to you that at the back of your handouts and at the online, Okay, online people, we will email you an evaluation form. On the back of your packets, there is an evaluation form. We would really appreciate your thoughts and comments on today's presentation and what we should be doing going forward. So with that, I'm going to introduce Kevin Katina. Thanks, Jesse. Today's uh, LNAPL uh, presentations are focused on the um, LNAPL initial recovery and interim remedial measures guidance document. Um, I'm pleased to say that the, the guidance document was posted to the web on June 14th. And for those of you that uh, were able to get to your email uh, yesterday, um, there was a Sarah listserv message uh, that announced the posting of that guidance document along with the response to comments document that was prepared um, in, in response to the uh, stakeholder uh, uh, review process that occurred uh, in December and January. Um, I'm really uh, pleased that that's, that's done. It was about a culmination of about a, a year's effort. And um, I can say as manager of the Bureau of Underground Storage Tanks, uh, dealing with LNAPL early on uh, is an area that certainly needed attention. Um, there are a lot of uh, responsible parties and consultants out there that, that did a great job dealing with LNAPL early on, but then there were a lot that didn't. Um, and that's one reason why we came out with regulatory and mandatory time frames to hopefully focus everyone's attention on dealing with LNAPL early on. Uh, and that's the attention of the LSORP, the consultant, the responsible party, uh, and also the, the department. In my presentation today, uh, I hope to uh, cover a little bit of background behind the preparation of the guidance document. Uh, secondly, uh, since uh, compliance with the regulatory and mandatory uh, time frames is a central theme of the guidance document, there'll be a number of slides that are that cover the uh, the time frames, and you'll see those time frames uh, be referenced throughout my presentation. Um, and lastly, uh, and also and more importantly, is uh, provide an overview of the guidance document and the six main uh, activities uh, that need to occur to remain in compliance with regard to LNAP. The LNAPL committee felt very strongly that the guidance document include a section on LNAPL behavior. And Steve Eulen from Langen Engineering will be going over a technical review of LNAPL behavior, as well as two case exa uh, examples from the practitioner's perspective uh, in order to remain in compliance with the LNAPL uh, requirements. And that will be followed by a question and answer period. These are the members of the LNAPL Guidance Committee. 
committee was formed in June of 2010. And that consisted of uh, four consultants, uh, three reps from the department, and two reps representing responsible parties. Uh, and I can tell you and that the, uh, the group uh, that was assembled um, did an excellent job. Um, they really took the time to listen and understand uh, each other's positions, and the guidance document is, is certainly better for that. Uh, and publicly, I do want to express my thanks to all the members of the committee uh, for uh, the time and effort that went into the regular meetings that occurred over a pretty intensive six-month period of time uh, from June through, through December of 2010. It was interesting, the dynamics that went on in the committee um, where the reps from the regulated community uh, tried to help uh, focus the department that, you know, you're writing guidance document, guys, not writing regulations, versus um, the department reps uh, emphasizing that we had to make sure that there were key activities uh, that occurred in the investigation of El Napo as well as the follow-up with the proper documentation. That was a pretty interesting dynamic. Um, I do want to say that at, at one of the committee meetings, uh, one of the DEP reps mentioned to me, boy, I, I wish I had these consultants on, on my cases. And really what it comes down to, that's what this guidance doc, technical guidance document preparation is, is all about. Um, increasing the quality of the work uh, that's being submitted to the department. Um, providing the flexibility um, necessary uh, to the consultants and the LSRPs to make those professional judgment calls to remediate these sites. Again, a very anecdotal comment, but it gets the strikes to the heart of the guidance committees and the work that uh, everyone uh, put forth to, to get this done. Here's the timeline for the development of the guidance document. And the uh, two dates that I really want to draw your attention to um, are the date of June 2010 when the first El Napa committee meeting was held uh, through December of 2010 where the committee finished its first draft. That was a six-month process. Um, even though we had a draft El Napa guidance document out in February of 2010, it still took us six months to pull together the final committee guidance document. This was, was not a just a rubber stamp effort to get out um, the, the, the early draft into some final form. This is the El Napple definition that we're working with. Um, this comes out of the, the tech regs. It's Hydrocarbons that exist as a separate and immiscible phase liquid when in contact with water and their air can exist as a continuous phase mobile or discontinuous mass immobile that is less dense than water at ambient temperature. just want to point out that I, I, I just um, it's important not to um, confuse this definition with the definition of free product in the tech regs that includes, the includes in that definition solids and semi-solids. -solid We're focused on uh, liquid with regard to uh, this guidance document and the El Napple uh, time frames. Once the um, El Napple time frames, uh, or should I say the El Napple time frames are triggered uh, based upon the presence of 0.01 feet of El Napple in a collection point. And the definition of a collection point is interpreted very broadly. And the guidance document refers to collection points as test pits, excavation, piezometers, monitoring wells, surface water, test pits, um, sumps, utility vaults, etc. So in any collection point where El Napple can be measured or observed and you have greater than 0.01 feet, you trigger the El Napple time frames. 
One item I do want to mention, and this also came up during the committee discussion, is the LNAPL timeframes are not triggered based upon the presence of a sheen or the presence of um, LNAPL in soil that might exceed an extractable petroleum hydrocarbon concentration that might be indicative of the presence of product. Once the LNAPL time frames are triggered, uh, this is the timeline that uh, develops. Now the time frames are split between uh, regulatory and mandatory time frames. Regulatory time frames are found in the tech regs at uh, section 1.12. Uh, the mandatory time frames are found in the uh, administrative requirements for remediation of contaminated sites or the ARCS rule at uh, chapter 3.3. Uh, so from the uh, date of discovery, um, you need to start with your initial recovery. And that occurs up through the uh, first 60 days. And by day 60, you need to submit your reporting form to the department identifying that you uh, have found LMAPL and basically what you did with regard to your initial recovery. At last count, uh, in early May, we had received over 400 uh, initial LNAPL reporting forms at the department. Also from the date of the LNAPL triggering event, you need to start uh, delineating the horizontal and vertical extent of LNAPL, start to build your conceptual site model, and within one year, start your interim remedial measure. And within that uh, one year, submit your uh, LNAPL report, as well as your form that accompanies that. Following that one year time frame, uh, you need to implement the RIM, IRM, update the conceptual site model, conduct any maintenance and monitoring that needs to occur until the final remedy is achieved for the, for the site. Um, certainly, you know, extensions can be obtained, uh, and Steve did a great job this morning going over regulatory and mandatory extensions, and I don't need to cover that here. When we were preparing uh, a dry run of our presentations, um, some of the colleagues at the department uh, suggested that I uh, present the timeline in an alternate format. Basically, what should I be doing over the particular time frames? In zero to 60 days, you need to immediately identify and stop the LNAPL discharge. Uh, certainly, if the leak is from an underground storage tank that's in service, you need to pump that tank out. Um, you need to evaluate and protect receptors, um, depending on the type of product that you have. Uh, you might need to quickly evaluate whether or not products getting into utilities, basements, sumps, uh, to evaluate any potential vapor concerns. Uh, one item I want to emphasize also, if this is a new discharge, while I don't have it on the slide, certainly you need to report uh, that identification of that discharge via the department's hotline. You need to conduct the initial recovery, and if appropriate, continue if applicable. For example, uh, if you identify LNAPL in a monitoring well and you uh, conduct a, um, a back out event, for example, and product reappears, um, the LSRP can certainly make a decision or the consultant on at what frequency uh, you want to continue with that uh, activity if product continues to reappear in that monitoring well. Um, Alternately, if you uh, conducted an excavation and product uh, was present, you pumped it out and you waited to see if uh, product returned, it didn't, uh, you backfilled your excavation. Uh, both of those activities, uh, whether it's the removal of product from the wells or from the excavation, they certainly count as initial recovery actions. And by day 60, submit your reporting form.
Now looking at the time frame from zero to 365 days and building on the uh, previous slide, need to delineate the extent of LNAPL, continue with the initial recovery if, it's, if applicable, protect and monitor receptors, build your conceptual site model, select and start your interim remedial measure, and submit your LNAPL report and obviously a form uh, by that one year. Greater than 365 days, implement your IRM until your final remedy. Update your conceptual site model as needed. Monitor your IRM, the LNAPL, and receptors. And include, um, oh, I guess I backed up a little bit here. Um, and include in the uh, greater than 365 days the monitoring of not only the effectiveness of the IRM, uh, the receptors, um, but also the LNAPL body itself as to whether or not uh, your remedy is, is uh, have, or effective in reducing the LNAPL. Um, the guidance document describes two main objectives, and those objectives are to prevent LNAPL migration and to reduce contaminant mass when practicable. Having an IRM for LNAPL makes, makes good technical sense because the earlier you can um, recover LNAPL, the less chance the LNAPL body has to spread horizontally and vertically, uh, creating a larger area of residual LNAPL, which is much more difficult to remediate. These LNAPL objectives uh, evolved out of the technical requirements for site remediation, particularly the interim remedial measure uh, requirements that uh, require um, contaminants to be removed, stabilized, uh, and contained as a primary objective. And that certainly applies in this uh, instance. Um, also want to emphasize that while these are the two main objectives related to LNAPL, IRM, you always need to stop the LNAPL discharge and consider protection of uh, human health and the environment. The six different activities uh, that are spelled out in the guidance document are listed here. Uh, we've already covered the first one, identifying um, the LNAPL trigger. The others include initial LNAPL recovery and reporting, undertaking the LNAPL specific uh, remedial investigation, starting the IRM and monitoring, reporting, and conducting monitoring. And as you can see, these items follow the timeline and the um, items that were specified in my previous timeline slides. The initial recovery is the action that's taken usually before a lot of information is known about the extent of uh, the LNAPL body. Um, but given the information that you do know, uh, you use professional judgment in defining how you want to respond to that initial discovery. To highlight some of the uh, opposite ends of the spectrum, um, if you have a catastrophic release from a gasoline tank and you're fortunate to have um, tank fuel monitoring wells and pea gravel, your response is going to be uh, probably fairly, fairly aggressive and, and quick versus the circumstance where you identify an eighth, eighth inch of product around a heavy heating oil tank that's been abandoned years ago. Certainly you're going to approach that, that differently. Some of the responses are listed here. Um, and Appendix A of the guidance document uh, includes a more extensive list of the different types of uh, actions that can be taken with regard to initial recovery. I want to emphasize that for existing LNAPL cases that were um, in the works prior to November 4, 2009, 
any actions that were taken, initial actions early on to recover LNAPL do count. You don't have to reinitiate initial recovery action after November 4th. Certainly if you did that early on when you discovered it, again, they count. And also um, an extension is an option. If the LSRP or consultant believes that it's um, a better decision to collect more site information before starting an initial recovery action, they can do that. They can either delay the initial recovery action to collect that additional data or combine it with the interim remedial measure. This is the form that's used for reporting um, the initial uh, LNAPL discovery. Uh, it's due within uh, 60 days, and it's available at the link that's ref uh, referenced on the slide. It uh, includes very basic information uh, about the site, the discovery of the LNAPL discharge, um, and also what was the initial action taken with respect to initial recovery. Um, the reporting on this form is outcome-based. And what I mean by that is it's not just reporting that you found L and Apple, but it's reporting what you did in terms of conducting an initial recovery action. Um, section uh, C1 of the, the guidance document, I believe, has a question in it that asks about, uh, was this result of an ongoing discharge? And if the answer is yes to that, here's a tip. Make sure the following question, which says, did you stop any ongoing discharge, is checked off yes. And certainly that's going to be something that our inspectors are going to be looking at. If you identify an ongoing discharge and you don't stop it, that's going to raise a red flag. Moving on to the one-year time frame, uh, four actions to ac accomplish. Uh, develop a conceptual site model determine the extent of LNAPL, initiate the IRM, and obviously you're reporting. Going into those four items a little bit in more detail, the LNAPL uh, Guidance Committee identified eight main items as, that needs to be considered as part of the conceptual site model for LNAPL. As you've heard before, uh, it's an iterative tool and needs to change as new information is generated and also guides the information gathering process. It needs to be scaled to meet site conditions. Uh, for example, if you have a gasoline discharge uh, and you're in a bedrock situation with potable wells and structures nearby, you're going to need a lot more information in that conceptual site model versus a uh, heavy fuel discharge um, in an area with no receptors and ultimately a plan to excavate that contamination. You need to scale this conceptual site model to the site complexity. The items listed, listed here, you've got to understand the LNAPL source, uh, both the chemical, chemical and physical properties of the LNAPL, site-specific hydrogeology, the extent of LNAPL, groundwater flow, potential receptors and migration pathways to those receptors, LNAPL saturation, mobility, and recoverability, and concentrations of related compounds in dissolved and vapor phase. With regard to that last item, uh, it's important to understand the concerns that the LNAPL body presents. Uh, is it uh, the concerns a function of the composition, of uh, the volatile fraction, for example, of the LNAPL body? Or is it a concern related to the saturation related to the LNAPL body, or potentially both? And one of the documents that's referenced uh, in, the, in the guidance document, um, the um, evaluating LNAPL remedial technologies for achieving product, uh, project goals, specifically identifies uh, compositional and saturation concerns as a way to help screen remedial technologies. So it's important to understand what concerns the LNAPL body presents. Appendix B of the guidance document does list uh, some examples of delineation methods. Certainly if you uh, 
choose to uh, use others. Um, the guidance document allows for that flexibility. Uh, Appendix B, the item, the methods that are listed uh, does include some advantages and disadvantages of the different methods. And they include some of the items listed here. Um, regardless of what method is used for um, LNAPL delineation, uh, certainly monitoring wells should be used uh, as part of that um, because over time regular well gauging of those monitoring wells will be needed to evaluate the change in the LNAPL uh, body and thickness in relationship to uh, water elevation changes. Now that we've uh, gone through the first three items, we're on to uh, selecting and initiating the IRM. The LNAPA guidance document lists two primary tools uh, to assist the user in uh, evaluating technologies. Um, and they can help in a way to narrow, a, syst uh, a systematic way to narrow the selection and screening of applicable technologies. Uh, the first one is the uh, ITRC document that I met, just mentioned, um, um, evaluating LNAPL remedial technologies for achieving product goals. That document is, is very extensive uh, and also current. It was uh, finalized, I believe, in December of 2009. And the other is the American Petroleum Institute Interactive Guide, um, both of which serve uh, the purpose of, again, helping the user screen LNAPL remedial technologies. Uh, target, again, implement your IRM within one year or sooner. Uh, certainly, if you conduct your initial recovery actions and you remove all LNAPL, that's a great outcome. Uh, but if that's not the case, within one year, uh, you need to start your, your IRM. The point of clarification, um, if it's technically supported by your conceptual site model, uh, you can continue with your initial recovery method as your IRM. You don't have to feel that you have to change just because you're going from an initial recovery method to an IRM. But again, it has to be technically supported. The other outcomes could be clearly a new approach the IRM, or it could be an outcome that is not practicable to recover uh, the LNAPL that's there, and that would have to be technically supported also. Um, in selecting and implementing the IRM, the investigator certainly needs to be open uh, to changing methods. If one method doesn't work, uh, you might have to uh, shift gears and, and change to another approach. For example, you might start out with a uh, pumping or hydraulic uh, recovery method. You might have to then switch to a, a phase change method that might include vacuum extraction or surfactant inject injection. And uh, one of the case studies that Steve will present uh, later on today is a good example of um, remaining flexible and changing the approach to dealing with uh, LNAPL recovery. <clears throat> when implementing the IRM, there's certainly a need for, for monitoring. And the guidance document suggests three different types of monitoring in Section 9. The first is monitoring the LNAPL body using a network of, of monitoring wells within and around the LNAPL body. By having the, uh, an adequate monitoring well network, um, you're going to be able to, do, to determine the impact of changing water elevations, monitor any changes in LNAPL thickness over time, and evaluate, obviously, whether or not the LNAPL body is migrating, which is one of the objectives that need to be accomplished uh, within the IRM. Secondly, monitoring receptors. And lastly, monitor the IRM for effectiveness. Section 9 also provides some uh, suggested monitoring protocols for three of the more common um, IRMs involving groundwater extraction, 
total fluid extraction, or surfactant injections. Before moving on to uh, reporting, a couple of points of clarification I want to mention about the IRM. Um, users reminded that uh, 6.1D of the tech regs uh, does require LNAP treatment or removal when practicable and containment when not practicable. And the whole point of this slide is the user needs to start out with the endpoint in mind. The IRM, and I'll hit the next one, uh, does not have to be a final remedy, but ultimately if you know you have to head to uh, treatment or removal when practicable and containment when it was not practicable, you need to start out with that in mind. So again, start out with the endpoint in mind um, with regard to your LNAPL uh, initial recovery in IRM. The IRM may or may not be the same as the initial recovery method. The IRM does not have to be completed within one year of the date of discovery of the LNAPL body. IRM could be monitoring only for sites with low solubility and high viscosity LNAPL, little or no dissolved groundwater contamination, and poor mass recovery. And in this case, the guidance document does suggest that the LNAPL report um, in this situation included a discussion of future LNAPL plans. And this, this is not being looked at as a, a do-nothing approach, but ultimately, uh, at some point, um, you will have to address the LNAPL, even in this situation. If the IRM is not effective and a new approach is needed to address the objectives that were laid out, time frames do not restart. Uh, the new approach will get reported, ultimately, in the next key document, which is most likely um, your complete remedial investigation and remedial action work plan. If product disappears and reappears, it's i.e. this is not a new release, time frames do not restart. You may need to refine your conceptual site model and modify your eye on the objectives, but you're not submitting a new uh, form uh, just because LNAPL reappeared and it was from the um, previous uh, discovery. The IRM does not have to remove all the LNAPL, but rather meet the performance metrics that are established by the LSRP for the selected IRM. If product appears and it's from a new release, even if you have a ongoing um, IRM, you need to report the new discovery of LNAPL with the 60-day reporting form. Now we're moving on to reporting. The IRM report and form that's due at the end of uh, one year should document the LNAPL source and the extent, the effectiveness of the initial recovery effort, and uh, the effectiveness of the IRM if that's already implemented. It should describe uh, and provide a justification for the IRM. It should include a discussion of the endpoints and performance metrics and also include the operational monitoring plan. Quick point on the IRM performance metrics. The endpoint of the selected IRM, again, is defined by the LSRP based upon the selected IRM to prevent migration and accomplish mass reduction. Um, the ITRC document referenced here at the particular section does have a discussion of endpoints and, and metrics. And I want to emphasize that even though the investigator uh, is selecting the endpoint and the, and the metrics for the IRM, if the IRM uh, does not accomplish the objectives and it fails to, uh, again, accomplish what it was set out to, to do, there is a need to continue with the IRM uh, possibly changing the, the method. The IRM 
doesn't stop if the method method fails. The IRM report should include uh, one of the three items listed here. It's either the LNAPA removal is complete and there's a monitoring plan. The removal is not complete and you're initiating your IRM until the goals and metrics are met. Or there's LNAPA remaining, but you've already come to the technical conclusion that removal and treatment is not practicable. And in that, in that case, you would include the technical rationale supporting that outcome. Monitoring plan would also be included. Appendix C of the guidance document uh, does uh, provide a suggested reporting format uh, for the typical report. And this, is, again, is designed to help uh, support the report preparation that you submit to the department after one year. I've heard some uh, limited feedback on that, that outline, and um, the folks that I've, I've talked with said that it has been fairly helpful in preparing the submission to the department. Um, this um, outline was uh, posted to the department's website uh, in February of 2011, and certainly we recognize that it was posted late in the end of February, and it, wouldn't, it wasn't available for uh, many of the uh, LNAPA reports that came in uh, in the beginning of February. Um, but it was certainly available for those that uh, requested an extension um, to submission of that uh, report and completing that, that one year, year activity. Quickly, in summary, identify the LNAPL trigger. You initiate the LNAPL recovery and report within 60 days. You undertake your LNAPL specific RI, understanding the LNAPL body early on, build your conceptual site model, initiate your IRM report and report within one year, and then conduct your monitoring. And lastly, here's my contact information. Uh, and certainly, uh, going forward, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to contact me on any of the items related to LNAPL or any of the members of the LNAPL committee. Okay. Uh, questions and answers uh, will be taken uh, after the next LNAPL presentation. And I'm pleased to uh, introduce uh, Steve Ulin from LNAPL. Um, we were very fortunate to have uh, Steve on the uh, LNAPL committee. Um, Steve, uh, for the past two years or so, was one of the uh, ITRC LNAPL trainers. Uh, so what you see here is, is right up Steve's alley. Steve Ulan. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everybody. How's everybody doing? Hanging in there? I, uh, I've been doing a lot of LNAPL training, it seems like, and, and the last few times I'm always going last, so I'm the closer again. LNAPL bonus round, I call it. Um, I'm glad to be here. We, the, uh, when we're talking about LNAPL, and, and I, I call this technical overview, Kevin mentioned sort of a, a, an overview of LNAPL behavior. Um, really talking about multi-phase fluid flow through porous media, which I, I love to say, multi-phase fluid flow. Um, but it's a complex topic. And um, early on in the, in the DEP guidance document, there's a statement that says it's expected that the investigator knows this topic. The, the guidance document is not laid out to be a, a comprehensive how-to summary of everything related to LNAPL science. The investigator is expected to know the science. There's a number of good references that are provided. Um, and I'll mention some of those today. Uh, so like the guidance document, this is meant to be a brief overview. Of, it's not a complete how-to. Um, what I will go over is some of the available training that's out there and talk about the ITRC a little bit. Um, Kevin mentioned it a few times, and I'm going to use some material from the ITRC. And I'm going to go over a brief, um, a brief overview of some key concepts, some basics, uh, touch on the conceptual site model, specific to LNAPL, 
I'm also going to touch on recoverability, which really comes into play a lot when we're talking about that initial recovery in IRM. Um, and I'll also touch on goals, objectives, and endpoints, which is another uh, key concept that the DEP guidance document took into play. And then finally, I got a couple case studies here where one's more of an active recovery and one that I call more of a maintenance recovery. Um, and I'll go through those uh, as briefly as I can. So the, Kevin mentioned the ITRC and a key organization that's been putting attention into LNAPL over the last few years. The, the LNAPL team was formed in 2007. I was fortunate to be a member of that. Um, and they've produced um, two different guidance documents since that time. Kevin mentioned the first one, um, evaluating LNAPL remedial technologies for achieving project goals, and also a natural source zone depletion document. Um, now, early on, the team did a, a survey of all the states. And some of the feedback that they got from the states was there, uh, there was a need for training. And to, fill, uh, to help fill this gap of state of the science versus state of the practice, it was really acknowledged that there's a gap there, that the state of the practice wasn't keeping up with a lot of really good thinking in recent years on the science of LNAPL. And so this is the title slide from the first training program. I'll go through them in a second. Uh, but just to give you an idea of where we started with our training on the ITRC team, providing an approved, uh, improved understanding of behavior in the subsurface and addressing that state of the science versus state of the practice. Now, I'm going to be using ITRC information. I'm fortunate to be able to do that as being part of the, the team. This is a disclaimer that they, they make us show when we're using their information. And, and, and what it says is, um, Evaluating LNAPL remedial technologies may cause mild anxiety. Don't attempt that while drinking alcohol. Or maybe you should be trying it on alcohol. I don't know. Um, it doesn't say that at all. I won't read it to you. Uh, it, ITRC tries to be accurate. Consult local experts. We don't endorse products. And if you want to use any ITRC information, you know, please ask. So this summarizes the, the, the training programs that they have. And, and most ITRC teams, um, typically, after they come up with a technical regulatory document, they do internet-based training. And in this case, there's three different internet-based training classes that we put together. Um, the first one, Understanding LNAPL Behavior, I showed you that title slide. The second one was focused on characterization and recoverability. I'm actually an instructor for part of that one. Uh, and then the third one was presenting the technical regulatory document. That's a evaluating LNAPL um, technologies for achieving product, project goals. Um, they, and if that's not enough, we it was decided also to go on to two-day classroom training. ITRC does that once in a while. There's a good vapor intrusion class that you might be aware of, two-day. Um, and this two-day classroom is getting rolled out this year. I believe the first one's in Minnesota in September. Um, and I should have pointed out, there's a the, the ITRC website was on an earlier slide. And the best part about this stuff is it's all free. You can download all of this off the CLUIN website or the ITRC website. And I really encourage everybody to follow up on this training. And um, you can download all the slides. You can watch um, recorded versions of it. And it comes up, the, the internet-based stuff comes up several times a year. So I'm going to start here with a simplified conceptual site model for LNAPL and, and um, just go through some of the main components. And you have your, your release source, a tank or a pipeline or a spill. And, and your LNAPL will move vertically downward under the force of gravity through that, the beta zone, through the unsaturated zone. Uh, and if there's enough LNAPL spilled, it'll continue to move and reach the saturated zone, starting with the capillary fringe and then the water table. So it'll begin to spread out there when it, just based on density difference between LNAPL and water. Um, and if there's enough spilled, again, it will begin to depress the water table. It'll penetrate the water table. Um, and form, you know, sort of this, this picture that you see here. Um, what's important to show here, really, and this captures the four phases of contamination that you'll get from LNAPL. You get the, the light non-aqueous phase, the actual liquid itself. Um, you'll get the vapor phase and the dissolved phase shown here. And then what's not shown here is the absorbed phase, the amount that's chemically or physically fixed to the soil. And that would be maybe right underneath that tank, okay? So this, this, this lays out that simple model. Now, while that is simple, there's several misconceptions. And this was something that came from, from the state survey and, and, and what ITRC likes to sort of start with is all these misperceptions about LNAPL. Let me go through them real quick. Um, 
Elnapple enters pores just as easily as groundwater. So that's not true. Um, that you can recover all Elnapple, not true. That all, El, uh, all the pores in an Elnapple plume are filled with Elnapple, and I'll talk about that one a little bit more. I'm going to touch on most of these. Um, that it floats on the water table or the capillary, capillary fringe like a pancake, that it doesn't penetrate below the water table. Uh, that the thickness you observe in a well is exaggerated by some numerical factor, 4, 10, you know, something like that, that you can generalize that. You can't. Um, that it's always equal, the thickness is always equal to the formation thickness. A big one. If you see Elnapple in a well, it's mobile and migrating. Okay? Um, not necessarily true. That Elnapple plumes spread due to groundwater flow. I'll touch on this one a little bit. This is a, another big misperception. And then finally, um, that the plumes continue to move over long time scales. So we're going to take a look at that <clears throat> simple conceptual site model and break it down a little bit more. Um, and starting with sort of this close-up view. And, and understanding the pore scale occurrence or behavior or distribution of Elnapple is really critical to understanding the, the broader distribution and how it behaves um, you know, more on a plume scale. And I'm going to go through each one of these little, these little blow-up um, viewports here. This is also sort of the first introduction to saturation, okay? The percentage of pore space that's filled with Elnapple. I'm going to talk about that in, in slides to follow. But if we start with the Vedosone A here, that viewport on the upper left, you have uh, Elnapples move down through that zone under the force of gravity. That area has drained. Um, so you have a little bit of Elnapple cut left behind. That's that absorbed phase that I talked about. Um, but what you can see there in your soil grains, you also have water. You have soil moisture. Water is the wetting fluid, the first fluid that that soil has seen. It'll coat the particles, the, the grains. It'll occupy the smaller pore spaces, okay? So Elnapple automatically will have to occupy larger pore spaces, a key concept. If you go vertically downward, you get into the mixed capillary fringe, all right, right at the top of the saturated zone. And you'll have a little bit more Elnapple. You still have your soil moisture, your wetting fluid, and you have air there. So you have all three phases, a little bit more uh, moisture, um, soil, water, sorry, a little bit more Elnapple, so the saturations are a little higher. You move farther down into a zone of high saturation, uh, upper right, and you can see you have Elnapple occupying those larger pores, filling it up, and you have water still in the system. You have two fluids in the system, no longer have air. Moving down a little bit further, you'll get a low to residual zone, saturation zone, where you can still see Elnapple in there, but it's primarily water, again, no air still two fluids. And then finally, the, uh, the water-only zone, where you have water occupying the pore, pore spaces, um, but no Elnapple itself. Whatever you have there is dissolved in the water. Okay. So this is a different view on a pore scale. Um, and that left-hand figure is about a 10 micron photograph of soil pores. You can see the soil grains in yellow. Uh, and the wetting fluid, the water is the dark color, the black, occupying those smaller pores. And then you have your non-wetting fluid. You have the Elnapple, that, that bluish uh, droplet, if you will, in the, in the larger pore space. Um, and so the importance here is to introduce this idea of pore entry pressure, this resistance to movement of Elnapple into and out of water-saturated soil pores. And Elnapple will only move into water wet pores when that entry pressure is overcome, or entry pressure, or resistance. Now in this case, resistance is made up of a bunch of different forces. You have, you have the water head, the pressure. Um, you also have surface tension forces. You remember your, your, whatever, ninth grade chemistry or physics class with the little pitot tube stuck in a cup of water, and the, the water climbs up that pitot tube due to surface tension. On the sides of the on the sides of the tube, that's their your capillary forces that are holding water, drawing water and Elnapple into the pores. Um, and so, the the little graphic here, the schematic on the right, sort of indicates you have to have internal fluid pressures that that will overcome pore entry pressure that'll deform that Elnapple to push out the water in the next pore space and move into that next pore space. And this is how it works to distribute Elnapple both vertically and horizontally. So this is happening in all directions. So this, um, talking about vertical Elnapple distribution, and this really drives home that uh, 
that distribution um, concept. And, and, and let me talk about these two figures. On the left-hand side, labeled pancake model. This is our misperception, okay, where you have El Napple um, that's occupying this zone near the top of the water table uh, at 100% saturation, that it's filling all the pore spaces. The little cube on the left down below, it shows that um, uniform distribution floating on the water table, okay? That's the misperception, does not occur like that. On the right-hand side, what you have is reality, where you have water and El Napple occupying the pores together. Um, and, and what happens um, is what we just learned, the El Napple saturation is dependent on pressure, right? And on the right-hand figure, you can see that, that pressure varies with depth. So you're going to have L-Napple saturation varying with depth. Um, and, and what that's called really is vertical equilibrium. And it's a major assumption when we're talking about unconfined systems, unconfined hydrogeologic systems with L-Napple. Vertical equilibrium is very important. Oh, and I should point out, um, and this, is, this has been something that's been talked about a lot, but on that right-hand figure where you have your L-Napple thickness in a well, the current thinking is that that thickness does generally represent the zone of saturation in the subsurface. You just have to remember that that zone of saturation is highly variable and it isn't at 100 percent. And so in an unconfined system, it does indicate, a, so it, it is indicative of that smear zone or that saturation zone that you have. And there's some people that are trying to nail that down more quantitatively, but that's been something that's been talked about lately in the for the academic community. So this is another way to show saturation or vertical distribution near the water table. Uh, and these are two examples. I'm going to try and make the point between sort of reality, real measurements of saturation and modeled measurements of saturation. Um, and these, both these curves are called um, saturation profiles. And the x-axis is percent saturation. Okay, so again, percent pore space filled with l -napple. And the, the y-axis is elevation or feet above water table. Okay, that's the actual, just the depth, if you will. Uh, and on the right hand, or I'm sorry, the left hand side, we have our typical um, saturation profile for a homogeneous soil. We call that our shark fin. On the, on the El Napple team, working late nights and weekends in hotel rooms somewhere, drinking a lot of coffee, you get a little punchy and you start to see things in all these curves. We call that our shark fin. ITRC will refer to it as that. Um, and the data points on this curve are actual data. And then the curve itself, the blue line, the shark fin, is a modeled saturation profile. That's using one of the API calculation tools, okay? And so that'll show you the type of distribution and, and agreement that you might be able to get with a homogeneous soil. Now on the right-hand side, we have a more complex subsurface conditions. We have six different soil types. And again, it's been modeled, and it shows in that, uh, that jagged blue line. But you can see the data points that represent actual saturation conditions. And you can see how variable it is. Um, and so the couple key points, you get sat the vertical distribution isn't all uniform, as I said. The, the way you model it and the way you measure it in the field don't necessarily match, although these show pretty good uh, agreement. This is the kind of agreement you can expect. Um, it is highly variable due to soil heterogeneities. And finally, you don't get 100% saturation. You can see these show 30, 40, 50%, um, which would be considered relatively high. You never have 100% saturation of El Napo. Just to focus on that non-uniform saturation again, and, and mostly I want to look at the picture here. What this is is a soil core. Um, it's a great tool where you take a Shelby tube sample, you freeze it, you send it to one of these specialty labs, they cut it open. And on the left-hand side is a white light photograph. Um, it might be a little bit hard to see. It shows you the percent fines in there, 27% up top. And down a little farther is 47%. Um, and that just shows you a white light photo of the soil grains. On the right-hand side is, a, is an ultraviolet light photo. Um, and the double bonds in El Napple and benzene will fluoresce under ultraviolet light, light. So you get that orange color. Great tool to visually see the, the variation in El Napple saturations. What you can see here, the higher El Napple saturation occurs in the coarser grain soil. Like I said earlier, El Napple is going to occupy the larger pores. The wet water, the wetting fluid is going to occupy the smaller pores. 
um, and you get your so you get your lower LNAPL saturation, your fine grain soil. Um, not cheap. Really, a powerful tool to visualize your LNAPL behavior, um, particularly like you know near the water table at a, in a soil boring. So moving on to another very important concept, the concept of residual saturation. Um, LNAPL can only move if the saturation levels are greater than the residual saturation. And what the residual saturation is, is the fraction of the pore space occupied by LNAPL that cannot be mobilized under an applied gradient. Okay? It's like an irreducible water saturation is another analogous term. And we use the sponge Again, as an, anal an analogy, if you have a wet sponge that's dripping wet, you have a saturation that's able to move out of that sponge. It's greater than its residual saturation. If it stops dripping, what the sponge is still holding is its residual saturation. What can't leave that porous medium, although it may still be quite wet, right? So residual saturations can be high, can represent high concentrations, and yet it's not able to move. That last point at the very bottom, it's kind of a complex way to say it, but when your oil saturation is less than your residual saturation, non-multi-phase flow fate and transport decision frameworks work well. Really what that's saying is if you don't have saturations above residual, if everything's below residual saturation, we're not dealing with free product. What we're dealing with is the other concerns that Kevin mentioned that might come from your free product or from your LNAPL. Um, non-free product, the vapor concerns, the dissolved concerns, other risks, okay? So this is just a collection of data to give you an idea of what type of residual saturations you can expect. Uh, this was put together by Jack Parker back in the late 80s, um, and it's a graph that just shows you residual saturations the, um, in different soil conditions. And the pink is, is for the saturated zone, and the blue is for the unsaturated zone. So an important point that you can see, and it's a little counterintuitive, is that your residual saturations are higher in the saturated zone than they are in the unsaturated zone. Um, not necessarily what you might think of. That's because the unsaturated zone can drain, can drain under the force of gravity, and so more LNAPL can leave those pores. Whereas if it's a saturated soil, it, uh, the LNAPL would have to displace water to drain, and so it holds more, okay? And you can see the types of residual saturations uh, ranging up to you know, five to maybe 25%. So fairly high numbers, again, result in high concentrations. Um, so one, one thought here is if you had a saturated sand and you dewatered that sand, you'd be able to recover quite a bit more LNAPL, right? You would lower the residual saturation. You'd take it from saturated to unsaturated material, so it would give up more LNAPL. In a clay, if you were to dewater a clay, you might not make a difference at all. You can see there that the difference between uh, the, the saturated zone and the unsaturated zone residual saturation values, sorry, a lot of words there, are, are pretty close to the same thing. That's because clay holds a lot of water. It's got small, small uh, particles, very small pore sizes, high capillary pressure, so it'll hold a lot of water. So talking about the potentially mobile fraction, and I'm, I'm, I'm shifting my discussion to mobility here. Um, and this sort of sums up a bunch of the concepts that I've, I've laid out so far. This is our, uh, the, the graph is, again, that shark fin, that typical um, saturation profile, um, percent saturation along the x-axis. Um, and and I, the, the note there, the typical regulatory focus is on all of the LNAPL. Um, but the potentially mobile fraction, as we've talked about, is only that fraction that's above residual saturation that's shown as that black dashed line. So you can see right out of the right out off the bat that the mobile fraction, the fraction that you may be able to recover, is only a small amount of all the LNAPL in the system. Okay. So again, you have to think about what's left behind after you've taken out what's mobile. So just to talk about how LNAPL spreads, again, talking about mobility for a minute. Um, the the top graphic here shows time one, an early time frame after a spill, where you have a large LNAPL head. You still have an LNAPL head that's uh, driving the spread of LNAPL. That head will overcome the pore entry pressure out on the leading edge of the plume, 
And so that's a mobile situation. LNAPL is still spreading green light there, as, as it's shown simply. Um, down below this is time two, where that LNAPL head has dissipated. The spill's been stopped. The leak's been stopped. The LNAPL head is dissipated. And so you don't have those fluid pressures in your LNAPL to overcome poor entry pressure. And so the, L, the, the plume is no longer spreading. That leading edge can't push water out of the way. This is fairly typical, in fact. And it's been shown that um, that head will dissipate relatively quickly. And you'll get these stable plume situations where it's not migrating. Um, what, what this does show, however, is that core areas in your LNAPL plume may still have local mobility. They may still be mobile and, enter, and able to enter a well, drain into a well, if you will, but that the fluid pressures in the overall plume aren't enough to overcome poor entry pressure at the leading edge, so the plume is stable. And it's referred to as spatially self-limiting. If the LNAPL spill is stopped, if the leak is stopped, the amount of LNAPL that's been spilled can only move so far. Okay? Even though you may be left with local mobility in the core of the plume. This is another sort of graphic that sums up everything we're talking about, um, where, where I show it as three different scenarios in this case. Um, and the top one we just talked about, where we have a relatively high LNAPL head, the saturation is greater than residual saturation, um, so the condition is LNAPL in wells and it's mobile. And Kevin introduced this concept, and I'll touch on it in another slide. The driver here would be an LNAPL saturation driver. Okay. It's being, you know, it's moving because of the L, the saturation. If you have an, a mobile LNAPL plume, clearly you have a high priority. Right after stopping the spill or stopping the leak, you want to make sure you're addressing the mobility or the potential spreading of that LNAPL plume. The second panel here shows you have LNAPL saturation greater than residual. I just mentioned this in the core of the plume, so it will occur in the monitoring wells. Um, so it's got mobility locally, but it's not migrating on a plume scale. So your driver here may be a composition-based driver, or it may be a saturation-based driver, or both. You, you have some LNAPL to recover out of well, so you still have that saturation. And then the bottom one is where your LNAPL saturation is less than your residual saturation. You have no LNAPL in wells, uh, and your driver becomes a composition-based driver. And you're talking about soil concentrations, vapor phase, dissolved phase. Um, those kinds of things. And as I, I mentioned, the big misperception when you have LNAPL in a well, you, it may lead you to think that it's moving. Um, that second panel, because of the local mobility, pressure changes, water table changes, and I'll show this in a second, can change those thicknesses. So it can lead you to think that the, the whole plume is moving when really it's just local redistribution. And this, this indicates some of that behavior. This is a video. I didn't dare show a video, <laughs> although Nick did a great job and pulled that off. <laughs> I, I just don't have the guts. Um, I think you can access this video on the API website. Um, and, it, and it shows th these colors are basically apparent LNAPL thickness in wells. So it's a contour map of thickness. And, and it spans, I think, five years. Um, the thicknesses range to three or four feet. Um, but it's showing the, the, how the plume shows itself in monitoring wells um, over the temporal variations in water table. So the water table here varies around 8 feet. And you can see uh, upper left, low water table in April 82, you have a fairly big plume. And the high, high water, in fact, those little panels to the right of the picture show the, the relative water elevation in wells. Uh, at higher water, you get less water. LNAPL showing in wells to the point where September 86, the water table comes up and LNAPL actually doesn't occur in monitoring wells during that event and leads you to believe what? That it's gone. It's gone away. Then the water table drops and the LNAPL comes back. You can get substantial changes in the footprint of your LNAPL plume based on water table fluctuations. And the, the DEP document emphasizes the need for water table measurements. Um, Kevin mentioned it all, the monitoring. It, there's, there's mention in the document specifically in terms of um, uh, collecting water table measurements to represent the, the full range of water table variations that you'll have at your site, just for this reason, to make sure that you understand what's going on. Local redistribution here. 
Um, and so everything we've been talking about so far is based on an unconfined aquifer situation. Uh, the vertical equilibrium model, as I mentioned, um, this, this is showing several panels that, that vary from those simplifying assumptions. Um, the first one, upper left, is, is that unconfined aquifer, but it's under a water table rise. So what I just talked about, uh, and although the graphic doesn't necessarily get it across, your water table comes up and, it, um, and it'll decrease the amount of LNAPL in your monitoring well. So it's, it's like a local, it's, it's vertical e equilibrium based on the pressures. Your water table comes up, it's a higher pressure, the less it'll come into the well. Uh, to the right is perch, that's fairly straightforward, where you may have a perch zone above the water table, uh, and if the well screen penetrates that zone, you can have LNAPL actually draining into the well from a higher elevation. It can cause greater accumulations in the well, it can throw you off, it can make you think you have more. Um, and those perch zones, the, the, the reasons, uh, those low permeability zones that can cause perch conditions can be very small. We, we see that happening with uh, three inch, six inch silt zones sometimes. It can throw you off, it can, it can cause variations in thickness. Um, a confined situation, again, fairly simple to think about where you have LNAPL under confining layer and you have higher pressures, higher water pressures uh, that'll drive LNAPL thicknesses thicker in that well than might normally happen if it was unconfined. And then, of course, fractured systems, you sort of all bets are off. You, could, you can have lots of different occurrences when, when you have fractures and obviously hard to characterize. Uh, but the main point here, be careful out there. Make sure you're understanding your, your soil conditions locally as well as you know, on a site scale, as well as on a regional scale. That whole geologic interpretation becomes really important. So just to summarize some of these basics that I've gone through, um, LNAPLs are not distributed vertically in a pancake fashion, but distributed according to vertical equilibrium as a multi-phase. Um, and those saturations vary vertically, and they're always less than 100%. Um, saturations are not uniform, but depend on soil type, capillary pressure, soil heterogeneity, they vary a lot. Um, the specific volume, and I didn't really define what that is, but that's an integration of that saturation profile, cubic feet of LNAPL per square foot. Um, it, within the soil be greater in a coarse grain than a fine grain, okay? So for any given um, LNAPL thickness, again, LNAPL wants to occupy the, the larger pores, so you'll get more in a coarse grain material. Um, even though in fine grain material, you'll get substantial thicknesses in a well. That can be exaggerated, so to speak. Um, and as the LNAPL saturation increases, the relative permeability and velocity also increase. I didn't define relative permeability, but in a multi-phase system, it's the ability of one fluid to flow in the presence of another, okay? So that ability for LNAPL to flow in the presence of water um, will increase with increased saturation. A few more basic uh, summary points here. The pressure exerted by LNAPL must exceed the displacement pore entry pressure for LNAPL to enter a water-filled pore. We covered that pretty good. Um, and I said this, measurable LNAPL in a well does not necessarily indicate mobility uh, on a plume scale. LNAPL plumes generally come to stable configurations over relatively short periods of time. Um, and I talked about that next one. LNAPL release stops. The LNAPL near the water table will eventually cease to spread. It's that spatially self-limiting point. Um, and then finally, LNAPL plume may be stable at the LNAPL fringe, but there be, may be local redistribution within the LNAPL core. Now, it, just think about this for a second. You have, you have the LNAPL fringe, say that the, the leading edge of the plume is stable. Uh, the, the central part of the plume has local mobility, has thicknesses. It's got saturation that you can pump or recover. And the water table changes those thicknesses and wells over time and maybe misleads you to think it's moving. Well, what might you do? You might go put your pumping wells out on the leading edge, right? You've got to stop that, that movement, that, that false idea of movement. Well, you're going to be putting your pumping wells, your recovery wells, out where the LNAPL can't move. You may be drawing more LNAPL to you in doing that by increasing the saturations at the leading edge where the, the pumpable material, if you will, is back in the core. So it's a, it's a, it's a tricky situation that can lead you down a bad logical remediation approach. So this really drives home what Kevin first mentioned, this idea of, of what your concerns and what your drivers are. And ITRC was good to sort of categorize 
um, concerns, and they're shown here on the left, things like explosive hazards, dissolved concentrations, vapor concentrations, um, direct contact. Those are your composition-based drivers, okay? Those are the things that are based on the chemical composition of the L-napple, whether it's a carcinogenic or whether it's causing a vapor or dissolved phase, those kinds of things. The, the idea of mobility, the additional risk when you have free product, the additional risk of it being mobile and spreading, um, or what's characterized here as visible or aesthetic. It's in a well. There's a federal requirement that I, that I cite here, as well as a DEP requirement in New Jersey to recover to the maximum extent practicable because it's in a well. So you have that sort of visible aesthetic thing that you have to do it anyway. Um, those are saturation-based drivers. And so when you're evaluating remedial technologies, you want to be understanding these things, okay, and characterizing. And, and the tools that uh, ITRC provides categorize different um, technologies and approaches based on the concerns and drivers. Just a couple quick slides on the LMAPL conceptual site model. And this is just a, a nice graphic to, to drive home that point that it's an iterative process and that the conceptual site model is this link between characterizing your LMAPL, your composition, your saturation, your location, all your soil conditions, all the things that Kevin mentioned in his conceptual site model slide, um, and linking that to your LNAPL management, your decision making, what is the maximum extent practicable and how to meet that, or what your drivers are, whether it's mobility or future risk, or, or what your remedial objectives are, okay? So this conceptual site model becomes this, this tool to link everything you know about the LNAPL with all the decisions that you need to make on the management end. Uh, and this, this is more of these points sort of summarizing. It's that characterization and management link. Um, it's that description and interpretation of the physical and chemical state of the LNAPL body um, and facilitates that understanding and how to best remediate. Um, Kevin mentioned this really important point. The, the conceptual site model is scaled. So if you have a high risk situation, you need a more robust conceptual site model. If you have a large site situation, you might need a more robust conceptual site model. If it's a simple situation, the conceptual site model can maybe be simple, and you, you know, that may be adequate to represent it. Um, but that last point is, is, is the one I like that sort of drives that point home. Your conceptual site model is sufficient when additional information would likely not lead to a different decision, okay? And, and somewhat analogous to the idea of an LSRP writing an RAO of, of something that's protective of human health and the environment, as long as it's a good RAO, as long as... Uh, um, a different approach wouldn't have caused, or how does it say it, that it caused, it, it protected the environment and a different approach wouldn't have caused more protection or something like that. And, and this slide is just meant to remind me to introduce the idea of recoverability. And I've talked about it in terms of LNAPL mobility, but what, the, what everybody always falls into, we all fall into it, is um, the louder, the, you have LNAPL in a well, you know, that mindset of, we got to get it out of there. Let's pump it out of there, okay? So oftentimes it's talked about recovering um, or recoverability. It's talking about gravitational-based methods, pumping methods, a pump, a skimmer, you know, gravi gravity-based recovery. Um, and what I show on the left-hand side, again, you have your LNAPL in your monitoring well uh, and your saturation profile, that typical shark fin, um, and, and that's essentially aligned up, lined up with the, uh, the, the LNAPL thickness in your well. And the line on there um, shows residual saturation, and it's, it's a step function, so to speak. It's, it's one value for above the water table, one value for below. And then on the right-hand side, you show post-hydraulic recovery. You've theoretically pumped off all the LNAPL that you can. Um, and so what you're left with is a saturation profile with everything less than residual saturation. And theoretically, you don't have any more LNAPL in your well. Now, I'll, I'll make a note that this is theoretical. And in real, real life, it's very difficult to hydraulically recover all the LNAPL that's above residual saturation. You, your endpoint of hydraulic recovery is some practical endpoint. The pump, the sensors can't pick it up anymore. The pump can't pump that little. You know, you've got timer settings and those kinds of things. And so it's not untypical that you'll have LNAPL that still occurs in a monitoring well after you've effectively pumped everything that you can. 
So just to introduce the idea of objectives, goals, and performance metrics, and I think uh, ITRC document does this well, um, and the DEP document is consistent, uses consistent terminology, and it's important to distinguish um, this, distinguish these terms. So the remedial objectives um, are established to mitigate the LNAPL concerns, and, and you need a remedial objective for each LNAPL concern that you've identified. Now, in the DEP document, the objectives are set, the, the minimum objectives, if you will, prevent migration and recover mass. Um, your LNAPL remedial goals are very clear statements of of the objectives, but they're stated in the context of a remedial technology, okay? So you have a, an objective for every concern, and you have it stated in the terms of the technology that's going to address every concern. And then your performance metrics are the measurements that demonstrate achievement of that remedial goal. And as Kevin said, a very important aspect of the, the guidance document is the LSRP or the investigator, the user, uses his professional judgment, his or her professional judgment, to establish the goals and the, um, the metrics for the IRM. And the, the scenario one is a very, very simple example, but consistent with the DEP objective of um, stopping LNAPL migration. Your goal may be uh, remove LNAPL by skimming to reduce the head, okay? Uh, and then your metric may be um, you want to have no LNAPL appearing in a well. It's a fairly simple one. But you want to break that down to provide clarity to your, your remedial actions, your, your interim remedial measures. So let me try and get through a, a couple um, case studies here. And, and uh, I think I'm running a little long, so I appreciate your patience. But I'll try and move quickly. This, uh, this first case study is for active recovery. Um, I'm going to just walk through the process that we followed. And although it's a, a, we went through this site, it's a little older before the document was out, obviously. It, it generally followed. Um, the steps that are outlined in the in the DEP guidance document, uh, and it'll it'll provide an example of a conceptual site model, some of the more important points, and and hopefully some of those key points that led to the final remedy decision. Um, this is a quick graphic of the site. It's a large industrial facility in New Jersey on a waterway. That's all I can tell you. Um, it's a fairly large area. There was um, monitoring wells put in, and El Napple discovered in 2004. Uh, and then you, you, this shows you a graphic of all the different wells that were put in over time. And these lines, so the contour lines, are the thickness. So we had pretty good thicknesses. It was shown that these thicknesses varied pretty substantially. Um, now, one complicating factor here just to mention is you'll see my zero line going off to the lower right there. There was other LNAPL issues at this site um, bumping up against this plume that I'm showing here. And so um, that that was one of the important things that we found um, as we as we went through uh, as we went through the process. This is a very busy area too, and I guess maybe it might be hard to see on this aerial photo, but this is underneath um, buildings. There's lots of utilities, lots of subsurface structures, so that was a, a complicating factor as well. Um, and this is just an overview of the steps that we followed. There was a detailed remedial investigation that was conducted. Uh, or I should say maybe focused RI that was conducted for this LNAPL. Thirteen wells, it was a tidal study to understand the tidal fluctuations of that river and on groundwater based on the proximity. Um, we did petroleum fingerprint analysis to characterize the composition, again, of that LNAPL. Uh, we did the soil core physical property in the UV photos. I'll show you an example of that. Um, we did recoverability assessment using both bail down testing and some simple API modeling, kind of in a screening context. And we did initial recovery and then moved into IRM uh, with operational monitoring in parallel to that. So we were learning as we did this initial recovery. And as, as we did all these different steps, we were monitoring pretty uh, regularly. Um, and then we performed pilot testing to help support a final decision. Um, and then we had did the final remedy decision and we're in the process of design now. So this is an example of the kind of data that we got from a petroleum fingerprint analysis. You send a, a sample off to a specialty lab, um, and, and you get a chromatograph like this, and, and the people at the lab will interpret it for you and give you a, a, a write-up like the one shown here, um, which I sort of laugh when I say very, very specific, and not so much quantitative. 
a mixture of extremely weathered middle distillates such as diesel fuel or fuel oil, a smaller amount of heavy material, and perhaps a small amount of alkali. Thanks. Thanks for that. If I asked them for this twice, I'd get two versions of that. So it can be very difficult. And, and although you always want this to be much more specific, and if you did eight wells in this plume, you'd get eight different discussions. Don't be afraid by that. That's a, it's, it's an interpretive process. And these things are, these, this, although it's general and it's, it's pretty broad, it can be very valuable um, to, to indicate that. We know that you know, it's a middle distillate. It may be a light end, may not be a light end. Okay? It tells us that we need to do some things to understand that better. Um, here are my core photos, again, one of my favorite tools. Um, two core photos shown here, and you can see on the left-hand side, again, white light on the left, far left, and then the UV light photo right next to it. And there's three soil conditions shown in there, fine sand uh, in the top, fine sand and silt in the middle, and then you have a sand and gravel. You can almost see some of that gravel in the bottom. But from the UV fluorescence, you can tell that the, in this case, it looks like the saturation is fairly... Uh, uniform, if you will. Not necessarily what I told you before, but in this case you have pretty good saturation across this two-foot core. Um, maybe a little brighter in the gravel zone, but you have saturation throughout there. Same plume, generally the same depth, the right-hand photo. We have a silt and clay soil underlain by a sand and gravel soil, and again you can see that sand and gravel uh, you know, texture a little bit in the white light photo. And then on the far right, you have the UV, the fluorescence, where you only have L-napple occurring in that gravel seam. In fact, you don't have, you can almost say, no L-napple occurring in, this, in the silt and clay layer. Very specific zone where it's occurring here. So this tells you something, you know, when it comes to where am I going to set my pump or how am I going to recover this. And this starts to open our eyes to that potential variability of l maple saturations that we have in the site. Um, I mentioned we did, uh, we evaluated recoverability. This is a big industrial site again, so we were focused on um, recovering l maple We had substantial thicknesses, so an early focus was uh, how to recover. Um, and so we did these bail-down tests. And a bail-down test is essentially like a slug test, but you're doing it in l maple You're removing all the l maple from the well, attempting to not um, remove any water. You want to minimize disturbance of water. And then you monitor the recovery of that l maple thickness over time. Um, and we did five tests. Um, and, and what I like about this is how immediate you can see the results. Three of the tests showed you pretty good recovery here, and two of the tests didn't. Now what the curve is, it's time on a log scale on the x-axis just to condense the time frame that it took to recover. And it's percent recovery to the original thickness on the y-axis. I know that's hard to read. Um, but the top is 100%. So what this shows is in about 1,000 minutes, which I, I think are in 16 hours, two or three of those wells recovered to 70 or 80% of their original thickness. So pretty good recovery. Uh, and, and the two at the bottom, those two lines, those didn't recover. So these all started with similar thicknesses. You know, sim same site, same plume. Again, an indication of that variability you can expect. Now, Keep in mind the scale we're talking about here, those three, or the two in particular, that, that recovered really well. You know, we're looking to go pump that. It took 16 hours for those thicknesses to recover to those wells. That's no easy challenge to pump something that slowly. So you just got to keep that in mind again. Um, we did API modeling. I mentioned it was more of a screening. We took some site-specific data, a lot of lookup values. Um, and I don't have time to get into this. but. So there are three main outputs that you get from, it's called the LNAPL distribution and recovery model. It's available on the API uh, website. The, the upper left is just a thickness contour map shown in pretty colors. Um, the lower is the specific volume. So that's sort of an integration of the saturation values. And you can see that the bright spot, again, it's a, it, the colors represent different contours of saturation. Um, you can see that the bright spot is, is offset from the thickest uh, well thicknesses. So it's a slightly different footprint that you see when you you, you integrate saturation. Um, and then the upper right is recoverable volume. So you take saturation, you correct it for residual saturation, you subtract out what's residual, and there's a couple other factors that are in there, and you get a slightly different picture. Um, so again, not to get into this too much, but we're looking at satur uh, we're looking at recoverability, trying to understand the distribution, trying to understand what's recoverable, 
and comparing this kind of in a in a desktop review, if you will, to our bail down test, which is a rubber meets the road out at the site, pump a well, how much comes back, you know, that kind of test. Looking at recoverability a few different ways. So to summarize our conceptual site model, the plume is in proximity to, but not migrating towards the river. This is an interesting situation. It's a losing river in this area. The Elnap was flowing away from the river. Um, there was a large smear zone that was influenced by the tidal fluctuations. Um, so that kind of fits with some of those pictures I showed you, the UV photos. We have variable saturations. Um, obviously, I mentioned it's a mixture of petroleum middle distillates, varying degree of weathering, which, which right out of the gates tells you some might be recoverable and some not. And we saw that in the bail down test. Uh, but it was trapped in distinct zones. That showed on that UV photo due to heterogeneities and gravel seams. Um, bail down tests, again, supported that it was recoverable in the central core area of the plume. Uh, but using other bail down tests and the API modeling results that it showed that um, recoverability was not consistent and there were many areas that were not recoverable. And so we're starting to identify where our, our, our efforts are going to be best utilized. It's not all indicated by thicknesses in a well. Our initial recovery efforts here were done using a vacuum truck and we were fortunate to have a vacuum truck available on this large industrial site. Um, and so that was put to work almost immediately recovering free product from wells. Um, the, the different wells that we used and the extraction frequently were, frequency were selected and prioritized using all this information. So we adjusted that vacuum truck program over time and eventually formalized it as an, as an interim remedial measure that would be implemented three times a week. So three times a week we were hitting all these wells with the vacuum truck. Um, it represents a convenience. It also represents a speed. It would have been hard to put a permanent system here quickly. Uh, and in this case, we used the wellhead assembly so that that vacuum truck didn't just slurp out of a well, but it actually sealed up the top of the well and achieved, put the whole well under vacuum. So it achieved multi-phase extraction just to enhance. We implemented an operational monitoring program with quarterly gauging for uh, liquid levels, water levels, and thickness. Um, an ongoing evaluation of what we were getting from that vacuum truck program, volumes from wells, total volume, total water recovered, those kinds of things, um, and making ongoing adjustments um, based on those observations and those results, uh, drop tube depths and vacuum measurements, those kinds of things. And so this was very dynamic as we were going, as we moved into the IRM. We, we did pilot testing to evaluate two presumptive remedies, so to speak, skimming and multi-phase extraction. And we wanted to assess the feasibility. We used these uh, trailer mounted units that are shown in the photos. And, and the graph really sums it all up. The, the skimming showed very poor recovery, maybe five gallons a day, less than 10 gallons a day. Again, because of that large smear zone and tidal fluctuations, it was very difficult to set a skimmer effectively in the Elnapple zone, that was uh, in the Elnapple layer. On the other hand, multi-phase extraction, putting the whole wells under a vacuum, showed really good results. We got 345 gallons a day from some of those producing wells. Very good results, and up to a 60-foot vacuum radius of influence um, to help enhance that flow of Elnapple to those recovery wells. And so all these results are summed up here that skimming wasn't going to be easy to recover this. We needed to go to the, the high-energy, multi-phase extraction type vacuum-enhanced approach. So the, that's where we headed with a full-scale system. Um, that, was, that was selected. Uh, site construction and piping installation has been completed at this point, and fabrication of a mobile multi-phase extraction system is currently ongoing, with uh, hopefully starting that up later this year. Um, and I have the ultimate goal here is to recover free-phase Elnapple to the extent practicable. Um, that may not, that, that's the ultimate goal for this area, but not necessarily the ultimate remediation goal for the site. As I mentioned earlier, there's other things going on here, uh, other areas of Elnapple, other um, Elnapple to remediate that was nearby. And the site, the site is um, sort of being remediated on a site-wide scale as well. And this, this shows you a layout of that system, sort of, again, supporting my point I was just making. Based on all the obstructions, the um, you know, building equipment, uh, subsurface utilities, you can see how complete we were able to be or not compared to this contour map. Um, and, and it was a mobile unit, so we do realize we may need to move that around over time once we, we get the recovery in, this, in all these wells um, you know, 
down to that maximum extent practicable. And this is a, a 10 or 12 different wells. It's a, it's a 30 horsepower liquid ring pump, pumps at about 60 gallons per minute, um, separates out vapor uh, to carbon in this case because of mill distillates. We, we could get away with carbon uh, to treat the vapor and then all the uh, oily water goes to an on-site treatment plant. Again, very convenient with a big site like this. So very quickly, my last case study here, and this is just an example of what I'm calling maintenance recovery. Um, this is a typical small industrial site in New Jersey. It was a 20,000 gallon number six oil tank that leaked. They found water in it. The guy put in another tank nearby for heating the building, steam in the building, um, and he voluntarily puts in a monitoring well because somebody told him, you know, you get oil or water in your tank, that might mean you have a leak. Um, and sure enough, this is what he finds, thick, heavy, number six oil. Um, so we, we know we have a problem and we, we go to work trying to understand that. It was a detailed remedial investigations were conducted and, and these dashed lines here show sort of the evolution of our understanding of the extent based on the borings and the wells that we're able to put in at the site. And again, there's obstructions. This is an active facility. You can see that uh, some of this LNAPL, the, de the delineation went right up to the edge of the building. Um, we had to go back in subsequent events and get inside the building to install well points and those kinds of things. Um, and you can see how that extent grew as we filled in, you know, our delineation. Thicknesses here ranged like uh, to eight feet or more of number six oil. So this was a substantial amount of number six oil uh, and, and ugly, you know, hard to deal with. We immediately started with initial recovery, um, seeing what we could bail, doing bail down tests, using many different kinds of pumps. Um, and and what, this, th what this is is a, a cumulative product recovery curve and so it shows time across the bottom, um, days of operation in this case, and it shows cumulative gallons recovered on the y-axis. Uh, and it's just plotting this cumulative amount that we recovered. And the different colors show you different techniques we use, lots of different techniques to try and recover this, this amount of number six oil. Um, and I should say that there was, there was very serious concerns from the DEP and others that this stuff was moving. We had eight feet in some wells. This was thick, big plume. Um, and so, uh, and, and the thickness is varied, like I mentioned earlier. So we were trying everything we could, maximum extent practical, what else can we do? Um, I should also mention we ruined all kinds of probes and pumps and, and equipment doing this, because number six oil is just a bear to deal with. Um, but the green was manual bailing, that, that light blue was the siphon unit, that some innovative thing, somebody showed up from Vermont trying to sell us that. Um, the pink is using a piston pump and all those little data point dots, you know, those are weekly events, multiple day events. And you can see, kind of just looking at the gallons we were getting, we were getting like 10 gallons at a time, 5 gallons at a time, maybe 15 gallons at a time. No matter what we did, we could get about the amount that was standing in the wells. That's about all you got for number six oil. Um, we, we were afraid that wasn't good enough. So we went to pilot studies using, again, high vacuum extraction using a vacuum truck. Very convenient way to do a study and the guy drives away with all your oil and your water. You don't have to set up tanks and storage and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the dark blue shows the results of multiple vacuum events, high vacuum events. Using a wellhead seal, putting the entire well under vacuum, similar to what I mentioned before. We got a couple hundred gallons the first time, you know, 70 gallons the next time, 10 gallons the next time then another 70, depended on how much time. And we were able to use all these pilot studies to identify a frequency. Um, essentially, the conclusion was that this got a little bit more than what was standing in the well at the time that we did it. It had a little bit of an influence using you know, up to an atmosphere of vacuum, or three quarters of an atmosphere, about as high vacuum as you, high vacuum as you get. Um, and that we, what we showed was every 90 days, those wells if you gave it 90 days, those thicknesses would go back to the original thicknesses. So we set up a quarterly schedule. Um, and so this, this really shows the initial recovery transitioning into what we'll call here interim remedial measure, although we didn't label it that at the time, um, but a similar process to evaluate what's going to work and what are we going to do in the long term. 
Uh, and this is my last slide. This shows cumulative product recovery. Same curve now. What I just showed you is the lower left. And the rest of it is 13 years of quarterly high vacuum vacuum truck events done since then. We get about 40 gallons every quarter. Maintenance recovery. We're doing it because we have to recover to the maximum extent practicable. This the oil's not moving. It's it's almost glue at standard subsurface temperatures. Um, but this is what we needed to do to maintain, you know, to meet our requirements. Um, and, and it's a fairly efficient program. Quarterly vacuum truck events cost about $20,000 a year, maybe a little bit less. So it's not a bad approach. Um, and we've recovered 3,700 gallons to date. So something substantial. And again, kind of in that maintenance context. I'm sorry to have gone long. Um, I think we'll still answer questions if, if folks have a little bit more time to hang around. Thanks. Yes, sir. With respect to the, the LNAP time frames, there is no difference in, in the time frames. Um, certainly, um, you know, there's different exposure scenarios there for residential and, and non-residential. But when it comes down to, you know, the activities related to um, compliance with the LNAPA time frames, there is no difference. You might want to take that into consideration with respect to your receptor evaluation and how promptly you move forward. Um, but with respect to the time frames, no, there is no difference in time frames. Uh, uh, there's a there's a UHOT rule that's being uh, written now that will be coming out shortly, um, and it will address time frames specific to uh, unregulated heating oil tanks, the, the whole thing. So look for that. Other questions? Do you have a cost estimate for the first phase in terms of uh, this cost, the scale of cost there, that, yeah. that's, um, that's a large site, and I didn't get into sort of the size of that plume. It was several hundred feet across. Uh, but the, the multi-phase extraction trailer um, is around a half a million dollars. And um, I would say another million dollars for recovery wells and subsurface piping. Uh, and all the infrastructure to hook up those 10 to 12 recovery wells manifolded together to go to this trailer mounted unit. Thank you. Yeah, big site. Yes, uh, one of the questions online uh, asks, what do you recommend for a site impacted by several feet of LNAPL from unknown off-site source? Do they still report complete forms, IRM, subject to time frame? Um, well, first of all, if, if it's determined that the uh, contamination is from an off-site source, um, that responsible party who's dealing with that, that site where the LNAPA was found is not responsible for that contamination that's migrating onto their site. Um, certainly, um, you would want to report that, the presence of that contamination to the department um, as an unknown source. Uh, and make it clear that it's not related to um, the site that's being investigated. Um, in that instance, um, it's clearly there's, there's no need to initiate um, an IRM uh, because, again, it's not the responsibility of that, that property owner to conduct that IRM. Um, and it's certainly not subject to the, to the time frame. It's a function of letting the department know the presence of that uh, contamination. Um, and then it would be up to the department to proceed uh, uh, if there's any conditions that represent uh, 
you know, concern that we have to immediately get out there. Good. Yes. I don't know the issue of coming on site and off site. Do we still have to provide the department with the PA and the SI in order to convince the department that that's really is not coming from the subject, from our subject property? Um, with regard to uh, making that determination, we've always uh, established those, those two, two standards. Number one, uh, uh, monitoring wells uh, on the upgrading um, side of the property. Um, and also the completion of um, an investigation uh, to show that the contamination uh, is not um, originating from that and, and has not contributed to that contamination. Now, um, I, I stopped short of, of saying a required PASI because uh, PASI is only required um, in the ISRA program and, and, and site investigation is only required for the UST program following a tank closure. Um, however, um, if you want to prove that contamination is coming onto your site, you need to show that your site has not contributed. And the way to do that is by going through a PASI. Now, you, you might and, and we had this discussion early on with a, a number of uh, individuals when we had this discussion about when a PASI is required. Um, someone might be able to determine a source on their site without completing a PASI. So in fact, that site might be responsible. So you know, you might be able to do something less than a PASI and show that the site is in fact responsible for that contamination. That's correct. I can answer this next one. Um, Scott McRae sent in a question here. What did you find to be the most uh, reliable equipment or method to measure product thickness in a monitoring well when dealing with number six oil? Um, yeah, sorry you have to ask that question, Scott. I know how difficult it is. We, um, it's really hard to measure number six oil, and, and we found that very patient and detailed attention to your oil water interface probe was about the only way to do it. You can try and use, um, like there's an LNAP old indicator paste that w didn't really work very well. If your thickness is less than the thickness of a baler, you can um, oftentimes be very careful and get an almost accurate thickness just using a baler to see how much is in there. But the oil water interface probe is what we used. Um, the, the hard part is you have to clean them, and to clean them now you're using like a diesel fuel or something, and those interface probes don't take that kind of cleaning very often. So buy a, buy a couple, you'll need more than one. Do you want to take this next yeah. one? The uh, next question from Joe Russo, uh, does El Napple on water in an excavation trigger potable well testing 120 days and should monitoring wells be installed first to establish groundwater quality and flow direction? Um, the presence of groundwater contamination um, and certainly with El Napple on the water table you have that condition triggers the requirements for starting your, your well search and initiating your, your potable well sampling. Um, hopefully during that, that early time frame, you're starting to collect some groundwater data so you understand what the contaminants of concern are, groundwater flow, hopefully you can narrow down the number of wells that need to be sampled. Um, but yes, it does trigger the well search and, and sampling requirements. The next question um, from Dana for residential heating oil tanks at the present time, are LNAP form and IRM report exempt or required to be performed? Um, for residential heating oil tanks, um, the LNAP time frames do apply from a regulatory perspective. Um, regulatory or residential tanks uh, are exempted uh, from compliance with the mandatory time frame. Uh, there is a, um, a mention of this in the, the guidance document, um, and also there is a 
uh, unregulated heating oil tank rule uh, that will be coming out in September of this year. Uh, yes, the time frames do apply. The regulatory time frames do apply to homeowner tanks for the uh, reporting of the uh, presence of LNAPL, initiating your IRM, and your one-year reporting. Okay, next question from Scott McRae. Uh, what about VI concerns related to a product plume migrating onto your site from an off-site source? Um, we, we see that certainly happen from time to time, not only with El Napple, but also with groundwater contamination coming onto uh, the site. Um, now, if that contamination is not related to the site that you're investigating, um, your client's property uh, is being impacted and being damaged. Uh, so if there's the function of um, having to install a, a vapor intrusion system because you, you don't know the source, and for example, let's say your client is developing the property, um, wants to install a sub-slab system to ensure that there's no vapor intrusion concern, uh, concerns down the road, um, you potentially can file a, a claim against the Spill Act because that contamination is impacting your client's property. Um, we have uh, seen circumstances where that uh, has occurred. Um, also, uh, you know, reporting it to the department. Um, and the department, uh, depending on the concerns that it, it presents, might be in a situation where we have to spend public funds to deal with that contamination that's migrating onto the property as well as identifying that upgrading source. I think we have one more. Oh, you have a quick? Yeah, uh, in a situation where the uh, El Napo has been eliminated and uh, you're in a situation where you only have two, which is straight out of and a situation where uh, samples were only going to indicate that contaminants are below uh, the groundwater standards. And like, would you be ready to prepare an RAO for that uh, well, what uh, you, you need to do at that point is, is look at the, the Sheen guidance document uh, because that that guidance document that's posted on our website does provide some guidance as to when you can close a site where there's a, a Sheen present at that location. Um, and in that instance, if you meet those conditions, uh, you would then be able to prepare the, the RAO. Thank you. Uh, we have one last question. It's from Jerry Kasha, a colleague of mine at Langen. Uh, and he asks uh, that I show a slide where there's Elnapple below a confining layer and how did it get there. The uh, Good question. The, usually what happens is a low water table, the Elnapple goes to a lower zone and then um, it migrates and it migrates underneath a confining layer or it gets through the confining layer some, somehow. Uh, and then the water table comes back up. As typical in the in the coastal plain, you have these dipping sediments. Often what we see is at low water table, um, El Napo will migrate down um, oftentimes a, a coarse layer like a, a sand or a gravel layer, and it'll migrate a little bit down dip just based on the orientation of those layers. And then the water table comes back up, and it can be trapped below a confining layer that's above that, uh, that coarse zone. So I hope that answers your question. Um, don't forget your evaluation forms, either to Sue or uh, outside the, the door to Linda.